Inflation is sticky. The Fed has to do something. Its credibility is still on the line. We don't think that there is a material risk of broad-based challenges. Instead, we've been calling for this bumpy landing. What matters and what actually shocks my economic and inflation models is how fast they cut and when they start cutting. The market has anticipated a lot of rate cuts this year, but our economist still thinks it's off in the future. The Fed is going to be on hold until inflation gets down to something much closer to 2%, and that's, I think, going to take a while. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. I've forgotten what day it is. Totally. It's like every single morning. Of next week. It's fa- Sunday evening, cliff edge. <laughs> it's sort of <laughs> never ending. Yeah. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Reliably informed, it's Friday, almost getting into the weekend. Equity futures down about three quarters of 1%. Some European banking names struggling to get to the weekend here. Deutsche Bank Lisa down 12%. Over in German trading, UBS is down about 6%. No drama relative to the action we've seen over the last, say, two weeks or so. 6% is kind of like unchanged relative to what we have witnessed. But still pretty dicey stuff for some of these names. Especially because it's not just in the stock price. You're also seeing this in the credit default swaps, what people are charging to insure against a potential default surging for Deutsche Bank in particular. At what point does this indicate that we're not out of the woods? And I think that this is the larger concern. There have been all these measures, all of these uh, officials coming out and saying all is clear the banking system is sound and resilient and yet still those jitters are being reflected in market prices. Secretary Yellen I think it was her 50th appearance in like two days. (laughs) Yes. Finding a new way a different way to say the same thing you know that's been the last couple of weeks for her. I felt really bad for the Treasury Secretary over the last couple of weeks almost left to sort of hang out to dry lamb lamb for slaughter in the eyes of an administration that we haven't really heard much from apart from a statement after Sunday evening. I would completely agree because there are certain things that are not in her purview. She cannot do single-handedly. And it was very clear from the hearings in the House yesterday that a lot of the politicians were not interested in talking about deposit insurance. They weren't talking about longstanding solutions. They still wanted to talk about the budget and the debt ceiling and all these these other issues. So without their political will, how much can she say? She did amend her statement, though. She made this change. She added, certainly we would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. It didn't work, though. No, of course not. What does that mean? Yeah. It's the same thing she said all over again and again and again. What else can she say? Nothing. But that's the issue, right? But she's in front of the individuals that can make legislation to change Correct. the cap. That doesn't make sense to me. So why are we criticising the Treasury Secretary when the individuals who are questioning her are the ones that should be making legislation. I couldn't agree more, especially because had she come out and said, what we need right now is full deposit backstops, you guys have to get on board with that, that would absolutely cause panic in markets. Why is suddenly this needed? Why is she lobbying so hard for this at a time when people are saying the system is safe and sound? So either way, it's, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Let's get you to the weekend. The price action looks like this on the S&P 500, down about 7 tenths of 1%. Let's call it down 6 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500 still poised for a second week of gains. Yes, really, two weeks of banking turmoil and poised for a second week of gains on the S&P 500. Yields are down aggressively by 12 basis points, 330 on a US 10-year. The two-year yield is down another 20 basis points on the two-year. The two-year right now, 362. So that's basically near the lows of the week, 362.83. In fact, that takes out the lows of the week, Lisa. Just remarkable stuff to see the two-year down here. Briefly, 361. So yesterday we were down 10 basis points. The day before that we were down 23 basis points and we're dropping pretty aggressively this morning. And when you take a look at what people are expecting in terms of rate cuts, they are now pricing in 120 basis points, 1.2 percentage points of cuts through the end of January next year. So it just shows you how much the scenario has changed. We have been asking all week, when does the economic data matter? And we continue to say all week, it's all backward looking, at least until it's not. And right now we are going to get some economic data and people will tell you why it doesn't matter. However, I am going to be interested to see what the U.S. durable goods orders are. That comes out at 8.30 a.m. And what you saw building on what we saw over in Europe was ongoing strain in the goods sector, disinflation there, and ongoing upside surprises in the inflation and activity on the services. How much do we continue to see this? Do we start to see some softening in terms of uh, the durable goods orders? And do we start to see some recovery at a time when perhaps interest rates are going down? It's just a jumble, but it is relevant. 9.30 a.m., we hear from St. Louis Fed 
President James Bullard. Over to you. Did something break? You know, we're looking at that two-year yield and the round trip, the fact that now they're the lowest going back to September of last year. Has something shifted materially that Fed officials can point to and say, hey, markets, we got you, we see you, we understand what you're saying, and we will reflect that? Or are they going to continue to try to push back, I would say, and argue potentially uh, to no avail? Today, bids are due to uh, for the Silicon Valley Bank, either in its entirety or in parts. Evidently, there is some deal with Customers Bank Corp that's being discussed for summer part of a, a summer, all of the bank. The fact that the FDIC pushed back the bids, they're due today. And they had originally been due, I believe, last week. The fact that they did that has raised some questions. Does nobody want a bid? Did they want a better bid? Did they want more time to look under the hood and to understand what the liabilities were that they were taking on? I think that's going to be interesting to parse out. Do they like the people who are bidding? Are you raising that question too? Sure. Where the bids are coming from? Whether they want it to be a big bank, whether they want it to be another kind of local, regional, whether they want a consolidation of the middle rather than just... Not private equity. Well, yes, that's another thing, right? They don't want that to be the case because they want it to look good and feel good and regionals getting together. This is going to look good and feel good. What is this therapy? You know, Every I, day. It's, it's Friday it after a long I week. Know. Let's, let's talk about our feelings. I feel for Secretary Yellen in a big way. She found a new way to say the same thing. Take a listen. As I've said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion. And they are tools we could use again. The strong actions we have taken ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. Certainly, we would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. That's the new line. I'm not sure how different it is. Chris Moranga joins us now, co-CIO at Gabelli Funds. Chris, your words, the bank crisis, a feature, not a bug of Fed policy. Chris, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, I I think uh, we've talked for a long time about uh, Chair Powell pushing rates until something breaks. And clearly something is broken. He's made no, um, he hasn't been shy about, uh, about talking about the fact that this credit crisis is going to be disinflationary. Uh, it helps them uh, attack inflation. So um, as long as we can manage through this, it probably helps that part of the, the equation. If we can manage through it, if we can avoid a deeper crisis, one that spreads even more, Chris, is this sector attractive to you in any way, shape or form? Well, thankfully, we have uh, generally avoided cyclical or, and uh, sorry, we've generally avoided uh, commoditized businesses, and the, the borrow short, lend long business is somewhat commoditized. And um, it's become less attractive recently, in part because funding costs are going to go up. Banks are going to have to pay more for deposits. Uh, credit quality is likely deteriorating. There's going to be fewer loans, so fewer revenue opportunities, and almost certainly more regulation, including uh, higher credit standards, h- higher, um, higher ratios uh, required. And that's going to impact both the P and the E for these stocks. And, and so they're, they're less attractive. Not something I'd want to get involved with today. I feel like this market's been uh, exerting the maximal pain on the fat maximal number of traders at all times. Heading into this year, people were talking about value stocks and how banks fit into that and how big tech was going to be left for dead. Big tech has ripped. Banks are having trouble. At this point, do you still think that big tech can lead, given the concerns around growth, given the concerns that perhaps the cost cutting and the potential right sizing of the businesses is not over? Yeah, I would make a distinction about, yeah, obviously, there's been this uh, rotation back to tech, back to growth. I think much of that is related to uh, a safe haven trade. Uh, investors looking for these big nation state type companies with big uh, credit balances, cash flowing businesses uh, as, a, as, a, as a safe place to be. Um, small tech, profitless tech has not shared in as much in this, uh, in this rotation. And a higher interest rate environment, a, a recessionary environment, is not going to be good for those companies. Um, so, you know, we're still looking for the for the cash flow generators, um, companies with pricing power, and, and that's been the, the formula for a recessionary environment for an inflationary environment. We started this conversation, Chris, talking about the Fed hiking rates until something breaks, and something clearly has broken, as you said. I'm curious what that means about the way you invest in terms of do you go for diversification or do you go for further concentration in the companies that you know best? Yeah, I mean, we're obviously looking for diversification across both industries and companies. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, to a certain extent, we we, we want to focus on our core competencies. We want to uh, put our eggs in, in a basket and watch that basket. Um, and that's basically what we've been doing unchanged for 40 years. Chris, are we sleepwalking into a crisis, a much bigger one? 
I don't think, I, I'm certainly not sleepwalking, and I don't think the market is as well. The market is well aware of, of what's going on, and maybe uh, a little bit too nervous, uh, um, given the recency, for many of us, of the 07, 08 crisis. Um, obviously, lots of, lots of risks out there, and um, that's what you get paid to, to manage. Do you think that breeds complacency, though? Those that experienced 07, 08, who always sit there and say it's not 07, 08, Chris? It's always a little bit different, and, and clearly this time is different. I don't think we have quite the systemic issues in the banking system that we did back then. Um, obviously, um, you know, the, the Fed now, ha having raised rates so aggressively, does have some uh, ammunition, some dry powder uh, to, uh, in, to obviously cut rates and, and improve the situation. But, you know, it's, it's what you don't know that you worry about. Totally. And there's so much we don't know. Chris, we've got to leave it there. Thank you, sir. Chris Morangi there of Cabelli Funds. Lisa, there's tons we don't know still. The issue that I've been taking with a lot of what people are saying is this is a liquidity issue, not a credit issue. Well, liquidity issues always lead to credit issues if totally, they're long enough. Sure. I mean, this is the issue. It happened back in 2007 with the commercial paper market back in the asset-backed commercial paper market in Canada that sort of some people argue triggered all of the subsequent events. So at what point are we looking at some seizure in lending that creates the credit problems that aren't being priced into the market. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I just take distinct. I take issue with people who are trying to draw too clean of a distinction here because the two are deeply interrelated. Blaming Canada this morning. That's new. That's good. <laughs> people waking up in watching, America watching feeling, South Park. <laughs> feeling very good about that. <laughs> well, I mean, look. Ramos blaming Canada. Well, I mean, that's where Joe Biden is. So I guess. Look, I'm not blaming <laughs> Canada. Just to be very clear. Come on. You I just you know, this? just winding you up. I know you're tired from a long week. <laughs> yeah, Mike Gabe in the Bank of America. Downside risk to spending could grow if the banking sector stress causes a sharp tightening in lending standards. That's his line in his research in the last 24 hours, Lisa. I think that speaks precisely to what you're talking about. Yeah, this is going to be the issue, and this is the reason why people say that no matter what. What happens there's going to be more distress is it being priced in i don't know because if rates go lower and people have priced I, I, the the parameters of uncertainty are great it's just that drawing a distinction between liquidity and credit issues difficult for me to stomach given the fact that those are two so interrelated give I it a few more days those treasuries on those banks balance sheets won't be underwater anymore <laughs> Yeah. Two-year yield to running it so hard. We're yeah, down 25 basis points. The second that they aren't underwater again, let's yeah. start the whole narrative over again and we're back to runaway inflation. Can we talk about a TikTok CEO later? Yes, please. What a slick dude. Seriously, how well, polished. Except, you know, when they asked him, is this spying? And he's like, I wouldn't call it spying exactly. Uh, sure, and but the whole know, thing was just like... Just, just picture the scene. Everyone hates you. They're all throwing aggressive questions at you. I thought he dealt with them very well. And then we can talk about what it ultimately means for the company, because I don't think he helped the company at all. But, <laughs> but he looks good. He's a pretty slick dude. It's TikTok. Next hour, Trogerski is going to be joining us from FS Investments. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. prosecutors have charged Terraform Labs co-founder Do Kwan with orchestrating a massive cryptocurrency fraud. It's said to have wiped out at least $40 billion in market value. Kwan was already a fugitive from charges in his native South Korea. He was arrested Thursday in Montenegro. In Japan, inflation showed, slowed for the first time in more than a year. Consumer prices, excluding fresh food, rose 3.1 percent in February from a year ago, down more than a full percentage point. But without the impact of government subsidies for energy and travel, inflation would have been as high as 4.4 percent. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says regulators are prepared to take more steps if needed to protect the banking system. Those comments to Congress came a day after her remarks on nationwide deposit insurance that rattled markets. On Wednesday, Yellen said officials hadn't considered the possibility of expanding federal insurance temporarily to U.S. bank deposits. And China is urging Europe to play a role in supporting peace talks for Russia's war in Ukraine. That's despite the U.S. warning the Beijing's proposals would effectively freeze the Kremlin's territorial gains. China's top diplomat spoke to a French official about the peace plan not long after Xi Jinping wrapped up meeting with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I hope we're through the worst, uh, and I think there's still some some uh, some questions around business models uh, around the world. Is, mm -hmm. is 
Are, have there been weaknesses that have been exposed in the business models of, of any of the, of the companies that have had trouble that need to be addressed at this point? Um, but it, it certainly seems that the acute phase of, of the crisis is done. That's what everyone hopes, right? That was Bill Winters there, the Standard Chartered CEO. UBS is down 7% today. The latest story here at Bloomberg is there might be a DOJ probe into Credit Suisse, UBS, and some other names as well. Lisa are associated with helping Russian oligarchs evade sanctions. Now, on Sunday evening, you and I and the whole team were talking about this government guarantee. Sometimes you inherit legal problems when you make an acquisition like this, and maybe one is already brewing. That was a speculation under the hood in terms of what took so long for UBS to sign off, and it took so long, I should say, is days and hours rather than weeks and weeks. But the question really being, why do they demand such incredible concessions from the Swiss government unless they saw something under the hood that they didn't like? There's lots of complaints about what happened over the weekend. One of Credit Suisse's biggest shareholder groups wang in on UBS's rescue of its Swiss rival earlier this week, Vincent Kaufmann, the CEO of Ethos Foundation, saying the following, this situation is a big failure of corporate governance and may send a poor image of Switzerland for international institutional investors in terms of good governance. Vincent, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Vincent, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. I guess the first question is, how much room do you think you have for legal action here? Uh, very small. Uh, actually, very small. You know, in Switzerland, we don't know the, um, the concept of uh, uh, class action. That doesn't exist in uh, in our uh, law. Mismanagement, uh, it's very difficult. We could never use this in the UBS case, uh, or even in the collapse of Suisse in the, in the years uh, back 2000, while there was clearly mismanagement. So um, either against former executives of uh, Credit Suisse or the decision of the Federal Council, uh, there is really little to, to, to be done. Uh, we're still looking at options, but uh, at the end of the, this week, um, after having discussed with many people, we don't see many options. Um, we will still recommend at the next general meeting of Credit Suisse not to grant a discharge to, to the board, to, op to, to, to keep all uh, options open, if anything is revealed uh, afterwards, as you said, there is a lot of still uncertainty. So we really recommend shareholders not to grant a discharge to, to, to the board of director of Credit Suisse. Hard to know the counterfactuals, sir. But just to cut in, what do you think would have happened Monday morning if this deal wasn't made? Uh, it's, we will never know. <laughs> we will never know. But uh, I trust the Swiss government that they reached its decision as they were uh, aware of things that we didn't know, so I, I could clearly expect uh, the, the similar crisis as in 2008. Uh, I, I would I would have expected uh, the Lehman Brothers case, and then the start of uh, of, a, of, a, of a really big crisis. So is it just a postponement, or it, can we manage to avoid this? Uh, still to be seen, but yeah, obviously, if, if the government acted this way, uh, they knew things uh, which, yeah. I, I, I still have belief and trust in our government that they reach a, a good decision. Do you have any reason to suspect that you were not given accurate information about the condition the bank was in over the last couple of weeks? I mean, we had, the latest information we had was a financial year, uh, financial year and uh, 2022. The, the, the annual report had just been released, so we already had the interim financial uh, Q4 uh, result. But uh, as you know, the, 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 the full report was postponed by one week. Uh, following a uh, SEC uh, request. So the board was really uh, quite quiet, saying it's not nothing material, it's just reclass and so on. But still then the auditor and the management said about material weaknesses. So we only had the information of financial year and uh, uh, on, on, on Tuesday, I think. Uh, but I think the situation so, so co collapsed during the first uh, quarter. Uh, so we don't really have any further information about the outflows. We know that it was about 10, 10 billion per day from, from the statement of the Saudi National Bank on the Wednesday. So obviously there was big outflows, but we will never know. I think we will never have the, the clear figures that the government had on, on, on Saturday. Vincent, I'm curious from your perspective, given that you do talk to other shareholders, you represent them, what this does to Swiss companies going forward in terms of their credibility, the risk premia that people want to bake in to whatever they own from Switzerland? 
Yeah, I think it's uh, we had made big progress, I would say, in terms of corporate governance in Switzerland, keep being on, on shareholder rights. We, we have a lot of rights. We are advancing also uh, in terms of sustainability. So I think we were on a good move. And, and the, the fact that, yeah, the government now decided that shareholders would not have any say on this, that also the antitrust authorities will have no say on this, um, I think it's it's quite dangerous for the future. I hope it doesn't create a precedent that the government is overusing this power. Um, so we will be very uh, looking at this precisely in the future. So obviously, when when you remove such important right to shareholders, you 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 need to have good reason, uh, very good reason. Otherwise, yeah, it's quite catastrophic in terms of governance. So, so far, I, I'm not sure it's been seen already. In, the, the corporate world, those kind of decisions. Right, Vincent, and I, and I want to pick up on what you said, which is if this happens again, if this sets a precedent, then there could be consequences. Have you already talked with shareholders? Have you already talked with investors who are removing some of their funds from certain Swiss shares just because of the uncertainty, because there potentially could be better options elsewhere? No, honestly, no. Uh, I don't, didn't hear anything on, on this web from international investor. I think, you know, um, Many investors are still quite uh, passive investors, so replicating indices. So uh, that's still the main part. So as long as we have a large cap being part of those indices, I think uh, the, the international institutional investor will, will always have those, those exposure. And we have wonderful, actually, uh, industries and companies in Switzerland being leaders of their market. So in terms of mid and small cap, we have such a wonderful corporate uh, field. But I think we need to ensure that the governance of those companies remains at the highest level because, uh, of course, all investors now are looking at those environmental, social and governance. I think governance is coming back at the front of the scene. We were talking about environmental issues, very important, but you need to have a, a strong governance basis. And those failures being in the U.S., being in Switzerland now demonstrate that governance maybe was uh, underlooked by investors. So. For us, it's key that the governance mechanism works, that shareholders' rights are preserved uh, for the future. Vincent, thanks for joining us today. Vincent Kaufman there of Ethos, a shareholder group representing shareholders of Credit Suisse. A difficult week, long week for him. <laughs> anyway, sure. no shareholder vote. The Swiss came in. You saw the complaints, what, that quote we talked about earlier this week. What's the difference between Switzerland and other jurisdictions where you don't trust the rule of law? Just like that changed it over the weekend. So one of the big questions has been the consequences of this, the long-standing qu uh, consequences of this. And Vincent basically suggested that so far people aren't uh, willing to wholesale abandon Swiss holdings as a result of this uh, this particular ruling. That said, there have been a number of articles about Middle Eastern investors. This had been their first full significant foray back into the banking system since 2008 when they made this capital infusion into Credit Suisse. Now, perhaps not as interested in investing in some of the banking stocks uh, around the world. So, again, you wonder, there have to be consequences, whether it's the sure. contingent capital market or whether there's something much broader that really makes people rethink where they put their money. Let's talk about policy consequences right now. Two-year yield, down 22 basis points. We price it in a cut by June now. Is that the latest? That is the a latest. Cut by June. Yep. And people are looking at that just to be the beginning of a series of cut. It's not only one cut. It is a rate cutting cycle that we are now pricing in. There you go. <laughs> Market's saying you're done. Screaming you're done. And you're going to start cutting interest rates. Market's screaming you're done. And by the way, maybe you made a mistake, Jay Powell. I mean, that's been sort of the latest that we're hearing in the mood this morning. You know, perhaps you shouldn't have raised rates at all. I think it's really tricky. I think that he was going to be blamed no matter what he did. And oh, I think that he did. He towed the line very nicely. Just uncertain right now. History will judge whether that move this week was Triche or Volcker. You know, it'll either look really foolish in months to come or it will look like it was the right thing to do. And that's why those kind of decisions are impossible to make. It's a super hard decision. Futures down 7 tenths of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. some fascinating comments from the Bundesbank president this morning. The chief of the German central bank will keep raising rates for as long as needed because of inflation. Lisa, we'd welcome up speeding up of QT in 3Q. 
that is a pretty hawkish central bank right now, right? Well, especially given the backdrop. I mean, right now, given the fact that people are pricing in cuts in the U.S. and that all around the world, suddenly perhaps the rate hiking cycle is over. The fact that you get hawkish comments like that, really telling. On the flip side, are people buying it? Take a look at that German two-year yield. It's tanking like a stone. You can see it down to 2.27% uh, from as high as 3.3% on March 8th, a pivotal moment. So maybe he's just, you know, making a lot of noise and people are just kind of like, nah. A Deutsche Bank's down 12%. This Fed's saying we're not going to cut. And look what's happening in the bond market. Let's whip through it. Equities are lower on the S&P 500. We were poised for a second week of gains. Might wipe that out at the opening bell if this continues. We're down about eight tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down a half of one percent. You're familiar with the weightings on the Russell, the small caps, a tilt towards the financials in a way that the Nasdaq does not have that tilt. The Russell is negative by more than one percent. In the bond market, Lisa mentioned it yields dropping like a stone. Two year, Lisa down 22 basis points. Think of the move yesterday. On top of that, the move the day before. On top of that. I just look at that chart and I keep thinking March 8th when we saw that that peak of more than 5% for the two year coming all the way down to 3.6% something broke and that is the only way to understand this chart. Why are Fed officials, why are central bankers in Europe not reflecting that? And if we're wrong, what's going to give confidence to the market that no, nothing is broken. You guys are just histrionic. Do you want the high from Wednesday? High of the session Wednesday 425. <laughs> this that's, is that's two insane. days ago. 425. Again, this is the most liquid, most, uh, you know, most used benchmark in the world in terms of the bond market. When you look at U.S. Treasuries, the fact that you see yields jumping around to this degree, what does that tell you about where we are and how wide the parameters of outcomes are? Euro dollar down about nine tenths of one percent. The euro against the U.S. dollar 107. 31. That's a week of euro. Stronger dollar in the mix. That hasn't been the story of the last week. So the dollar lease are kicking back in as well. It's the haven trade as people get worried about the banks. How much are people pitting European banks versus U.S. banks and then making a currency call on it? Seriously, because that's essentially sure. what seems to be happening. You can't explain it by divergence in monetary policy because that would be supportive of the euro. We'll keep you up to speed on what's happening with Deutsche Bank as well. The stock's down about 13 percent. I've got to say no news, no real news in the last 24 hours for this for this name. UBS is down about 7 or 8 percent. There is some news there. They might get caught up in a DOJ probe and who knows? how that turns out. We know that those fines could be, they can be pretty hefty. They can be hefty. They can also create some reputational risk at a time when they were really solidifying the reputation in a much more concrete way. You're right. There is no news. Deutsche Bank, in fact, buying back some of their subordinated bonds Saw to that, try yeah. to, you know, fortify their balance sheet. This should be positive, I would think. I don't understand unless there just are people looking at potential counterparty risk or I don't want to spread rumors, but what would cause this? And maybe people just pile on. Was there anything positive about this? Take a listen to the TikTok CEO in front of Congress on Capitol Hill in front of a House committee. Take a listen. I have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I've I, asked find that. That, I find that actually preposterous. I have uh, looked in, I have seen no evidence of this happening. Mm. And in order to assure everybody here and all our users, our commitment is to move the data in, into the United States to be stored on American soil by an American company, overseen by American personnel. Clearly nothing he said yesterday was going to be sufficient. So here it is. Let's make it really, really simple. He can't change their minds. They don't like the plan he has to protect and store data here in the United States. They clearly don't trust this company. So I would say this. The longer they do this with a TikTok CEO, the more foolish the representatives of Congress start to look because they need to do something about it then and they've got to make a decision. Now, forcing a sale is the easy way out. Unfortunately, China will not allow that sale to go through. And that just agitates those who think China has the ultimate say over this company. So it becomes even more simpler than that. Ban it or don't ban it. But the longer you have these hearings without banning it, I think the more foolish the government looks and not the TikTok CEO. I would take that a step further and say it actually emboldens the CEO because this is a PR move for him, too. If you just clip out his responses, he looks measured and cool and trying to answer amid a firing squad. And for all of the people who are trying to say, look, he's just another executive, then he'll actually gain credibility. And on the flip side, to your point, if this is an issue of national security, do then something the issue about is it. very clear. Do something about it. And clearly, forced sales are not going to be allowed by China. So you're left with one option, not to ban or to ban.
it's it's not complex, is it? It well, really isn't. It gets more complicated when it's the young voters that well, could precisely. potentially get really and, upset and Lisa, taking their toys away. Then it's about politics and it's not about national security. Well, it's always about politics. Come on. Since when did you believe that things if it's were about, that pure? Look, if it's about national security, that shouldn't even be a question. We talked about this yesterday. This. Terry Haynes of Pangea is going to join us a little bit later. Look out for that conversation. We'll catch up with him in about 10 minutes' time. We've got a euro that's a whole lot weaker today. Euro dollar, negative nine-tenths of 1%. Al Salinos joins us now, global head of FX strategy at RBC. Al, so can we just start with the price action of this morning? What do you make of what's developing at the moment? It's so interesting, isn't it? Because we have gone up and down this week and basically back to where we were, I think, at some point on Wednesday. Um, and it's, as you said earlier, two very different um, drivers pulling in opposite direction. On the one hand, you've got the rate differential. And as Lisa said, that in isolation would argue for euro dollar higher. On the other hand, when we pivot away from worrying about U.S. banks to worrying about European banks, as markets are this morning, then that pushes euro dollar lower. What's really interesting to me, though, is that ultimately we're not going anywhere. And that realized vol in FX is a whole lot lower than it is in other asset classes at the moment. And that in itself gives rise to some interesting trades. Elsa, last year, everyone was a macro uh, investor, a macro analyst. This year, everyone is a bank analyst, or at least for the past two weeks. Given that, how much do you have to examine the balance sheet of banks on both sides of the Atlantic to make a currency call? Yeah, one of um, my FX clients made that comment yesterday. You know, in the FX market, we're all suddenly experts on something. You know, previously, it was weather balloons, and before that, it was Ukrainian munitions, and now it's bank stocks. Um, but the reality is that is what's driving our market at the moment. And, you know, luckily, we do have a very good team of bank analysts in-house at RBC, um, and they will make some points around the fact that you have a very well-regulated, well-capitalized banking sector in Europe, um, and that gives a lot of people a fair degree of confidence. That said, when it starts getting um, like it is today, you know, you see some quite large price action um, on the back of very little new news. Um, it does worry people, and the euro is naturally a, a loser in that environment. So how do you explain this in terms of the technicals of the market, the underpinning of the market, if there's a move that feeds on itself that is pretty violent, that gives rise to narratives that potentially are deeply uncomfortable, but there is no logic behind it that's discernible? <laughs> So I think what's making it even trickier at the moment, and in part perhaps explains the disconnect we're seeing between rates, effects, and equities, is that you've had um, investors very heavily positioned in some areas, very lightly positioned in others. I think part of the reason why FX is actually not really moving that much is precisely because it's not been the key area of focus for macro investors. We had a lot of people heavily positioned in rates at the start of the year, um, positions getting extended further through February when everybody was sure that it was going to be a much higher, tighter, um, longer rating um, increase cycle. And now that's where you're seeing the pain as all that gets washed out. So from a currency perspective, We've actually been fairly safe and able to eke out gains on the relative value trades on the crosses rather than just trying to take a bet on dollar up or dollar down. How much is a dollar going to continue acting as a haven given the fact that what you're saying sounds like short squeezes, unwinds of trades, things that are highly uh, specific to a market structure rather than some sort of macro event? Yeah, it's an interesting question because it's what you would have expected to some degree this week. I mean, if we listen to Chair Powell on Wednesday, what effectively he was saying is, we can't really give you forward guidance at the moment because we can write things down in the dot plot, but the reality is it's going to be determined by facts on the ground. And those cuts that are priced by the market could be justified, but the conditions that would warrant those cuts would be pretty aggressively bad conditions. So in that kind of environment, well, what do you do? You buy havens, um, you buy the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, the two most obvious ones, but you also buy the US dollar against risk proxies. And that's not what the market did this week. You know, we, we actually saw the dollar underperforming some of the riskier currencies. It doesn't make a whole load of sense. I think today we're seeing a little bit more sense return to markets where you're actually seeing the dollar start to outperform some of those riskier currencies. And in order to see that extend going forward, I think you begin to need to see it in the actual data. We'll get, you know, it, it'll be some time before we get the quarterly senior loan officer survey from the US, but we have some weekly indicators. I think that's what markets will be focused on going forward to take their cue. Alsa, thank you. Alsa Lindos there of RBC. What Alsa said at the end there, I think is really important. When they say data dependent, you've got to ask dependent on what data? The senior loan survey. 
that's it. It's going to come down to that. 100%. And that's what everyone seems to be focused on, not CPI, not payrolls. It's lending standards in America. That's the data point going forward. I've joked it's banking stocks, but you know where I'm going when I say that. People want to understand how much banks are restraining credit in response to some of the concerns around their balance sheet. People were also plumbing some of the Federal Reserve data that came out yesterday evening around 4.30, 4.15 and 4.30 p.m. yesterday to understand the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve surging to the highest levels going back to 2021. I mean, we're just seeing a resurgence. And people want to understand why and what this means for the stress that we're seeing in the banking system. Look at this move on a two-year. Only a couple of weeks ago, north of 5 percent right now 358 this move right now 358 take a look at twos versus tens the yield curve was negative 110 basis points back on march 8th and right now it's negative 30 and at least a moment ago it was negative 28 and if you take your pick on a curve right now that's twos tens let's go twos thirties two year against the 30 year it's now positive it's now positive i'll try and save the uh bond market jargon for you but that is one heck of a bull steepener that's come into this bond market over the last couple of weeks, which basically means the front end leads the move, yields aggressively lower at the front end as we start pricing in what? Cuts. The Fed said this week, median dot 23, just like the projections back in December, 5.1%. This market, one, doubts whether they can get there, and two, even if they can, they're not going to be there very long based on this market pricing. What's interesting is also you are seeing, yes, it's a bull steepener, you are seeing this really led by the front end, but lower, uh, but longer yields are also going lower. And so this isn't necessarily a belief that cutting rates is gonna cause runaway right uh, inflation. This is a complete reset of the whole inflationary backdrop that everyone's been talking up. It's a different time, it's an inflationary regime. Now people are like, eh, not that inflationary. Oh, yeah, it's a secular story. Yeah, not and so now much. all of a sudden, this financial stress is a disinflationary shock. For a long time. If Bob Michael at JP Morgan said every single point across the curve, two year out to 30 year, 3.00%. That was the call. I'm old enough Look, to remember when. We're, uh, we're getting yeah. closer. The 10 years at 329. I'm old enough to remember when people were calling for 7% 10 year yields. That was good, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. When was that? Last week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on TikTok next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. UBS and Credit Suisse are among the banks being looked at in a U.S. Justice Department investigation. Authorities want to know whether finance professionals help Russian oligarchs evade sanctions. Subpoenas also went to employees at some major U.S. banks. Credit Suisse and UBS both declined to comment. The U.S. has carried out airstrikes in Syria following a deadly attack there that killed one American contractor and wounded five service members. U.S. officials say a drone of Iranian origin crashed into a coalition base. According to the Pentagon, the U.S. airstrikes hit facilities linked to Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards. In North Korea, Kim Jong-un oversaw tests of weapons designed to deliver nuclear attacks against the U.S. and its allies. One of them was described as an underwater drone that can create a, quote, radioactive tsunami. The official North Korean news agency says the drone cruised for nearly 60 hours before detonating. The test also included cruise missiles carrying mock nuclear warheads. Billionaire bond investor Jerry Gunlock is joining the Jerome Powell is Wrong Chorus. The chief investment officer of Double Line Capital sees the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates substantially soon. And markets are signaling the Fed is wrong when it talks about the prospect for further interest rate hikes. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I've I, asked find that that, I find that actually preposterous. I, I have I, uh, I, looked I, in. I, I have really seen don't. no evidence of this happening. Mm -hmm. And in order to assure everybody here and all our users, our commitment is to move the data in, into the United States to be stored on American soil by an American company, overseen by American personnel. That was the TikTok CEO, a very, very polished, Slick performance. Pretty slick dude, Lisa, I've got to say. 
across a number of hours, but ultimately not making a difference whatsoever. But it was never going to make a difference. Nobody's mind was ever going to be changed. Terry Haynes of Pangea said this. This hearing, quote, isn't a debate, it's due process. Completing the hearing record before beginning to legislate, Terry went on to say, and creating a prime opportunity for the TikTok CEO to compound negatively the issues that beset the app's continued use in the US. Terry, I'm pleased to say, joins us now. Terry, what did you make of that? <laughs> well, uh, you've never seen a, uh, a better example of somebody publicly lighting themselves on fire uh, in, a, in a congressional hearing yesterday. Uh, the, the famous quote will always be uh, the quote uh, when asked uh, if they used uh, gather data to spy on U.S. citizens, the response began, I don't think the spying is the right way to describe it. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my comment, my comment on that, as you know, was, uh, and I quote, kaboom, in, in, uh, in full. So the, uh, you know, what you have here is a situation where, you know, there, there's a lot of diversionary stuff being thrown around here, but the basics are these. You have the heads of the United States intelligence community saying publicly a couple of weeks ago to Congress that uh, they think that TikTok itself is a national security concern because, as the FBI director said, uh, can use uh, that, that can, can be used to control software on millions of devices and also uh, drive narratives that divide Americans. Uh, the bipartisan heads of the intelligence committees, uh, Senate and House, agree with that. Uh, you just saw how bipartisan and how strong the belief is in the lead committee in the House uh, that does this stuff, Energy and Commerce Committee. And, um, you know, so what you're going to end up with here is, I think, is not a, an outright ban of TikTok, but you're going to have the administration given the tools to uh, to ban, to control uh, you know, whatever is necessary, TikTok and a broader swath of, uh, you know, apps or other, uh, other sorts of uh, e-issues. Uh, that seems like the direction of travel, at least over the next several months. Terry, I just wonder the option this president, this administration will ultimately choose. It feels like that a forced sale is a non-starter. The Chinese government has already said they won't allow it. Lisa and I were talking about how just that response alone agitates those who believe that the Chinese government has the final say over this company. It's just the nature of doing business in China. Terry, how do you think this story ends? Do they ban it or won't they ban it? Well, well, I, I, I absolutely agree with you about the forced sale, by the way. And let me say not only that you're absolutely right about the uh, the way United States policymakers respond to the you know, kind of Chinese threats and demands, uh, but the concerns that have been expressed by the intelligence community that I just mentioned have, you know, have never been countermanded by the Chinese. They've never said, no, that's ridiculous. We don't do that. Here's what we do. Uh, you know, and the algorithm is supposedly either some kind of state secret or at least, you know, very shrouded in, uh, uh, in, uh, in commercial proprietary uh, nature. So, you know, what you have here is a situation where uh, the, the United States government is given some sort of scythius like uh, ability uh, to look at things broader than just individual apps, but TikTok becomes the first example of this. And yeah, I do think it's eventually banned. Uh, you know, I have it now. Uh, before yesterday, I had it at 75 percent likely by end of 2023. Right now, I have it at 85 percent thanks to the performance of the CEO yesterday. Terry, let's talk about timing. How likely is it get, that it gets banned before 2024? Or do we have to wait until election cycle is over before anything materially, ha materially happens or materially changes with this company? My view of this today, Lisa, is that uh, the TikTok probably gets banned before the end of 2023, uh, and not much b more before, because what you end up having to do uh, logistically is you have to have the legislation passed, and people agree on what the legislation is, whether it should be a straight-up ban of TikTok or this broader cifius like process that I mentioned. I think that wins. Um, you have to pass the legislation, get it to the administration. The administration has to set up its process and then actually have to use the process. Uh, you know, we're now at the end of March. I'll give you nine more months. All that happens and uh, TikTok gets banned, but not before the end of, uh, not before the end of the year. There are a lot of I don't think election politics has anything to do with this when, when something is as bipartisan as this. Well, and, and there are a lot of implications here, whether it's having to do with some of the social issues that a number of Congress members highlighted in these hearings or whether it's due to our broader international policy. I 
I want to read you this quote from a Biden White House advisor, a former Biden White House advisor. The TikTok mm. battles are indicative of the end of an era, this era where U.S.-Chinese business uh, relations can continue absent considerations of geopolitics is over. Terry, how much does a potential ban of TikTok implicate other companies that are of Chinese origin that do business in the U.S.? Uh, well, I think it implicates them hugely. Sure, I mean, but what you're seeing now is, you know, I don't think uh, I don't think I'd agree with the uh, end of an era comment, but that's uh, what we're at. we're now moving into is a situation where the geopolitics are different, frankly. Uh, but uh, what you're going to have is uh, is Chinese companies looked at top to bottom, and I think American investments in China looked at top to bottom for potential national security implications in a way that's broader than the, than the way that it used to be done solely under the CFIUS uh, uh, banner, which was which is and was individual companies, individual circumstances. Those will all be uh, continue to be assessed, uh, but you're going to be looking at this much broad, much more broadly in a situation of, you know, what is it? What is it that the Chinese government is trying to do? How are they trying to do it? Uh, what is our response to you know either permitting it or stopping it? Terry, uh, whatever that's, happened that's to the where we're going. to the basic argument for reciprocity? Whatever happened to that argument? What was the argument for reciprocity, John? Just the idea that if they want to be here, that the United States should be able to be there. Well, I think I think that's still valid. I think that still remains. But what you have is a, is now a you know a decade or more where uh, American policymakers have you know gradually gotten more aware of the of other basics, and the other basics include the fact that. Uh, uh, intellectual property from American companies is stolen in China. That the technology is stolen. That you know, uh, China is is using. They they would say, uh, you know, piggybacking on uh, on American companies to to gain advantage. And there is an overwhelming sense that 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 particular era I think is over. Great to catch up, Terry. As always, Terry Haynes there of Pangea on the latest. Just brilliant. Great note. If you can get in touch with Terry and get hold of it, he's leaning hard. Lisa towards a ban. 85% chance, he thinks, after that hearing. He really does hone in on that one moment where they asked, you know, whether uh, TikTok spies on people who use the platform. And the executive said, I wouldn't call it exactly spying. And that was just, you know, to Terry's I, I world. I wouldn't describe it that way. Kaboom. <laughs> this was never going to change anyone's Correct. minds. And to his point, it's just kind of like the process to then get to legislate. And then ultimately, it's over to the president and the administration to make a decision. Again, though, I do wonder, you know, he said at this point when there's as much bipartisan support, you can't imagine that politics gets in the way too much. I can imagine it. I mean, I do think that that always has been in the back of people's minds because we've been talking about this for a long time. I also wonder how much it complicates the issue that there are concerns about social media on a broader level. And so there's some discussion around that that muddies the conversation about national security. And clearly there's a big divide, I would say a major divide, between how Congress feels about the national security issue with China, the reality of the situation, and how the consumers who use that app feel about it, because I don't think they care about it at all did in you, the same way. Did you see those comments by Congress members basically saying, I know people are going to think that I'm just trying to take your fun away, but you know, you'll know you care about this someday. And you heard a lot of you know trying to convince it's, people comments like well, this that. Is the, this is the argument of the TikTok CEO, and this is the benefit they have, the advantage they have. They've created an app that is incredibly popular with the American consumer. Incredibly popular. And I would argue that, and I know that this is the case at home because we have these discussions, a lot of people who use the platform think that they are immune to any kind of misinformation. They're immune to manipulation. They're immune to being, uh, you know, sort of influenced one way or another through the platform. They say, you know, we get silly news bits. We get, you know, fun dance moves. We don't necessarily, they, I'm talking, you know, specifically at home, other people who are progeny. But I'm curious what kind of influences they could be subject to and whether we should have a class on you know, propaganda and oh. you know, the importance of being, well, just the importance of being... And communism. Well, not, I'm not even saying that. I mean, just the critical thinking skills. I'm talking on a broad sense, critical on thinking the same skills. same page. I think it's that's great. really important Blame to the education do. system. I'm I just, with you. I think that's They've got to understand key. about the dangers of communism. It's not just communism. It's, it's also It's the whole socialist thought process. It's, no, I'm with it's you. Even it's everything. Here. No, it's everything. No, that's not what I'm just saying. Just go even further. It's great. <laughs> no, Keep digging. No, that's not what I'm saying. Troy <laughs> of FS Investments joining us shortly. Ramo's not going to stop. No, I'm not.
As I've said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion, and they are tools we could use again. The strong actions we've taken ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. Certainly, we would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. That last line is a new line from Secretary Yellen, but that new line is not really making a difference. Five different ways to say the same thing by Secretary Yellen over the last week and criticise heavily for it, which I don't understand, and Lisa, you and I have talked about it throughout this morning. The only thing that people are uh, uh, perhaps a little more rightly criticising is that Jay Powell and Janet Yellen seem to have a slightly different tone in terms of all deposits are basically guaranteed versus we have emergency measures that we can take and we'll come out and we'll make them. Are they different kinds of comments? You can parse out the questions, but there is an issue of anything that can really be done has to come from Congress, and there isn't really the will to do it in Congress. So what was the purpose of Congress asking these questions of her this week? What were they trying to do? What were they trying to achieve? Signal. Are you setting me up? No, I'm just asking. They're basically trying to say, we're on top of it, but we don't want to take legislative action because that could set us up for a political liability. I'm not wrong. So why didn't she just say that back? That wouldn't fly well. As far as I understand it so far, to the best of my knowledge, it is up to you to legislate to change the cap, the cap on deposits. Because then she's setting a signal that the banking system needs that, right? So this is she's she's caught between two very difficult decisions. How does she come out? She tried this the first day, it didn't work, and saying totally resilient. We don't need to do anything more. Uh, you know, we can step in potentially if there's a problem, but we're not discussing major major measures because everything's fine. Didn't work. Stocks tanked. And then the next day she comes out and they say, okay, well, how about now? E2, uh, Brutus, and she's like, well, you know, things. Uh, Let's go back know. two weekends. Okay. Go yes. back two weekends. There were banks that some people outside of this country had never heard of before that failed, and they used the systemic risk exception to make those depositors whole. How small do you think the bank would have to be? How irrelevant do you think the financial institution would need to be at this point, in this very febrile moment, for it not to be given the systemic risk exception? That's a fair point. My, my question is, ultimately, there is so much she's implying here. There's so much information implied with, through which, what she's saying that is ultimately, we're going to be there again to do the same thing and make depositors whole. Because at this point, you'd have to imagine that any financial institution that they just let fail and didn't make depositors whole would have some degree of contagion risk associated with it. The problem is there's going to be a cost associated with that, so that continues to make uh, stock investors nervous, and you're not solving the ultimate problem, which is a mismatch in the duration of the assets and the liabilities of some of these smaller banks that have more volatile deposits and more concentrated deposit bases. So if you're not solving the problem, then she cannot talk her way out of this, and it's not her problem to talk her way out of. It is ultimately something that lies with We're Congress. We're on the same page. I said earlier, give it a few more days and a hold to maturity portfolio will no longer be underwater because this bond market rally is rip-roaring and fast. The two-year yields down 19 basis points, 364. The 10-year down 11. We're at 331. Equity softer this morning, down 8 or 9 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. And the euro, even with some hawkish central bank talk from the German central bank governor, the euro is still weaker. Euro dollar a negative nine tenths of one percent the euro against the dollar 107 39 joining us now from dc Anne marie amh what more can secretary yellen say well, I think what the strategy is going to be is that she doesn't say any more. Yesterday was a cleanup, clearly for the markets, but also for Congress. It really throws this idea of the FDIC insurance limit and that cap in their hands. And I think that's what Secretary Yellen was trying to say on Wednesday in her Q&A when she was asked about this. And she said, we have not discussed this blanket approach to FDIC insurance, cat depositor insurance, because that is in the hands of legislators. That is lawmakers. But the markets obviously tanked. So yesterday she wanted to make sure that she put the markets uh, well aware that if there was a systemic emergency need for this, this is something that they could step in. And I think for now, that's all we're going to hear from the Treasury Secretary uh, at the moment. But of course, if there is going to be more contagion, they have to step in. There will likely be more statements from either Yellen or Fed Chair Jay Powell. Perhaps we're talking too much about Janet Yellen, and really the interest lies in what was not discussed yesterday in that hearing, or the lack of questions really around deposit insurance. Mostly people were curious about 
the budget and the debt default uh, ceiling and things mm -hmm. of this nature. What kind of signal do you take from that in terms of the willingness of Congress members to take any action on deposits, especially given that there are political liabilities around that? So when it comes to the deposits, when I speak to congressmen and women, all they keep saying and senators is that they want to see all the details first and they don't just want to shoot at the hip because there was a crisis and react. So next week there's going to be a ton of hearings and you're going to have regulators on the Hill. They've also invited bank executives on the Hill of these failed banks. And I think after that, you potentially will maybe see momentum in if Congress is going to raise the cap. Like Senator Elizabeth Warren said, like Congressman Boyle said to us last night, they don't know a number yet, but potentially north of $250,000 could be lifted. When it comes to the debt ceiling, this is actually starting to heat up a little bit because we heard from the Republican budget chair and they said that they are ready to go to the White House with what is called a sheet, a sheet, a, a debt sheet, not a cheat sheet, a debt limit sheet. I'm basically telling the Biden administration from Speaker McCarthy's office and the Repo House Republicans, these are the demands we have in order to sign up to raise the debt ceiling. But one thing is key there. The White House has said they want to see the Republican budget. That's not going to make it by April 15th. So they're trying to go with this minimum sheet to the White House and say, these are our demands. Can we start negotiations? But it's finally the first time since McCarthy and Biden spoke on February 1st that we are seeing an inch towards potential discussions on debt ceiling talks. How did talks go with Trudeau? What was that about? Well, he's still there. Uh, the president is in Canada. He's in Ottawa. Josh Wingrove is traveling with him. Uh, they are discussing uh, potentially asylum seekers and a deal on that. They're also going to be discussing things like the war in Ukraine, Canada's efforts to support the U.S. and other allies. This is really just a normal stop for the president. You always have to visit your neighbor to the north. Um, I wouldn't expect a lot of news, but it comes at a great time for Biden. If you noticed, he hasn't been out front talking about what's going on in the markets. He's left that to his Treasury secretary. Obviously, Fed Chair Jay Powell talks about it. This week, Lucky Biden him. has really... Yeah, he's been talking with celebrities. Bruce Springsteen was there this week. Ted Lasso was there this week. He's in Canada. And when he comes back, him and his administration are going on a 20-state tour to pitch the legislative success they've had the prior two years. All of this, obviously, as he gears up to announce for 2024. So you're saying the president at the moment is in campaign mode? I would say at the moment it's partially campaign mode and also pointing the finger at Congress pointing the finger at bank executives and letting his cabinet men members and like Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and also the likes of Lael Brainer, the head of the NEC now, Jeff Zients, his, his um, chief of staff, letting them deal with the market fallout and not getting the president in front of reporters or cameras to talk about it. This could be also because they don't want to spark more fear and risk. If the president really is concerned and starts talking about it, then that's quite probably a little bit of nervous jitters for the market as well. Hey, mate, thank you. Anne-Marie, down in Washington, D.C. There's two ways of looking at this, Lisa. One is that another way is that he's just leaving his Treasury secretary hanging out to dry. That's one way. Another, to Anne-Marie's point, they're damned if they do and damned if they don't right now. If you see the president on your screens every day talking about a banking crisis in America... It's probably not what you want to hear from the president every single day when you're trying to let this settle down, is it? No, and I think that's the reason why they haven't really come out with the same kind of, we're proposing emergency measures, this is a serious issue. They're trying to do that, but behind the scenes. And that's the reason why people are looking at the data, looking at how much money still is being uh, lent out to banks and saying, it isn't all clear yet. Ted Lasso, is that why Tom's off? <laughs> just honestly, just finally just understood why he's off. Because he's down there. Fanboying no, over Ted Lasso. Binging Ted Lasso. With, is that season out? I with, haven't watched any of it yet. He's doing it alongside President Biden, who evidently... Did they drop the whole season all at once? I don't know. Do you I don't think know I, either. I don't I'm think I get... I'm to watch it this weekend. Britbox. Britbox. What's Britbox? It's like British television ah, in the US. Britbox. Right, nice. Okay. Is this show available on Britbox? <laughs> 
I'm not sure. It depends on uh, whether Should Tom. Be. I think that Tom would actually make it more like BritBox than you. Uh, Tom probably would, yeah. A hundred percent. He's such an Anglophobe. He, he just loves the UK. Basically, every conversation is, this is how they do it in America. Anglophile, but, rather, but, I should but, say. But, but John, isn't Sometimes it so with much me better? Sometimes it's an Anglophile, you know, just to be, like, being around me, but anyway. <laughs> but no, seriously, like, John, isn't it so much better over in the United Kingdom? He asks me that question all the time. Mm -hmm. The reason he asks me that question is to try and get me to offend Americans, which is why he always asks the question, because he hopes that one day I'll just go home. <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> go ahead. From New York right now. Good morning. Equity futures negative three quarters of one percent on the S&P 500. We're a bit softer, lighter, lower negative. Big moves in the bond market, so let's discuss them. Two year earlier, sub 360. Right now, let's call it 365. Still lower though, aggressively so by 18 basis points. On a 10 year, we're down about 11 or 12 basis points. 330, 331 on a 10 year. This whole curve just gravitating towards. 3% at the moment. I don't know what's going to disrupt that trend. This is basically the trade that Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management was pushing. He said the whole curve, twos out to 30s, can drop to 3.00%. Uh, who am I to argue with him? We're only about 30 basis points away on a 10 year. Outside of that, in the FX market, the German central bank governor saying, let's go, there's more to do. And in Q3, I'd like to speed up QT. And then the euro starts dropping. Euro dollar, 107.45, negative eight tenths of 1%. It's a real, real turn in risk, I would say, in like the last, let's call it two hours, Lisa, where equities kind of fell out of bed. The dollar ripped and the front end of this curve really started to rally quite hard. I don't like giving a narrative to this because it's impossible and I'll be made to look foolish pretty quickly. I do wonder how much is technical in terms of unwinds that are going on because it's hard to explain uh, the underpinnings of it. And we take a look at some of the names that really have driven some of this and it really is in the bank complex, particularly over in Europe. Deutsche Bank, I'm looking at the ADRs right now, the American Depository Receipts, and they're down more than 10 percent. Why? I don't know. Pick your narrative. Pick your reason. But we're not necessarily seeing it. Similar with UBS. Those shares down not as much as uh, Deutsche Bank. And perhaps there's more of a rationale. But you saw the turn lower, John, to your point, only recently uh, accelerating with losses. Both of these shares near session lows, those shares down more than 5 percent. And this is bleeding back into the regionals in the U.S. I'm looking at PacWest and I'm looking at Western Alliance, not First Republic, but some of the other shares of banks that have come under pressure in the United States. PacWest shares since March 8th are down 65 percent and Western Alliance shares down 56 percent. Massive. And it just continues at a time where there isn't a sense of what's going to cap the fear that some people have been perpetuating. Everything we've talked about all morning and the biggest amount of feedback I've had, obviously, is I'm a Ted Lasso. Everyone obviously. wants me to know it's it's episode by episode. Season three is out. It's available on Apple TV. I mean, what is this, a commercial? I kind of knew that already. I just didn't know whether it was all at once. I just couldn't remember. I couldn't remember. because I never, watch it? I never watched season one when it was coming out. I watched it after it was already out, so I binged that. I wasn't that impressed with season two. I've got to be honest with you. All right. Well, you'll get a we'll lot of mail We'll see what's in store for too. season three. I'm sure everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got an opinion. I think I should get BritBox. I think you I should could, get BritBox. Yeah, I think so. I think I, what are you going to watch? Coronation Street? I think I'm going to watch some soap operas. You then, should. You know, basically, you know, it'll bleed out into the that's show. How you, that's which how is... you switch off and relax. I used to watch British soap operas? Totally. Other people's problems, you know? Not your own. <laughs> Thank you. I like Deborah that. Deborah Cunningham, Global Liquidity Market CIO at Federated Hermes, joins us now. Deborah, this move in the bond market is just a monster move. This two year, to see the yield down another 18 basis points. I know we've got used to moves like this, Deborah, but it's not usual, it's unusual to see the bond market move the way it has done over the last couple of weeks, Deborah. What do you think it signals? You know, I think it signals that the. Um, uh, there's there's unrest and unsurety in the economy. So, you know, we, we over the course of the last two weeks, if you look at, you know, sort of Fed funds futures, we've gone from, you know, prior to the, the regional banking issues here in the U.S., expecting a terminal rate of 570, you know, all the way down to expecting a terminal rate of 460. And, you know, now kind of back up in the 510 area based on, the FOMC meeting this week, but I think there's no conviction. People see, um, you know, different statistics being reported from an economic standpoint, whether they're inflation, retail sales, any number of statistics. And then they see um, stories about Credit Suisse, stories about um, Silicon Valley Bank, the bank term funding program. And there's just, I think it, it's sentiment based on what the last information was that you saw, and it's it's driving the market 
on a day by day, hour by hour basis, up and down. Deborah, yesterday afternoon, uh, the Investment uh, Company Institute came out with data on total inflows into money market funds in the U.S. over the past week. And just looking at this, it's been the biggest two-week increase in money market funds outstanding going back to April 2020. And John was talking about how prior episodes were 2008 and 2000 and all of these crisis periods. What is the implication about where that money is not going? about what that does to an economy when there is that kind of fear that causes billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to flood into money market funds? Well, I think it's a little bit different than the issues of the pandemic and the 2008 financial uh, crisis time period. I think those were driven by mostly fear and Basically, people were leaving the risk markets, the equity market, the longer term fixed income market, and they were being driven into deposits and money market funds. For this one, I think there's money coming out of deposits. Maybe it started from a fear perspective way back uh, two weeks ago. Seems like it could have been, you know, two months ago at least, uh, but it's only two weeks with the issues uh, around surrounding Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. And ultimately, I think what that did is cause people to look at where their short-term liquidity is. And a lot, a lot of it is in uninsured deposits or in insured deposits, but with very, very low rates, 75 basis points, 1%. And then when you look at a money market fund, you look at something that's giving you four and a half, you know, climbing towards 5% with a lot of diversification, a lot of diversification and much higher credit quality than what a bank loan portfolio would give you, which is what typically would be backing bank deposits. So I think it's a little bit different as to the origin of this cash for this time versus what it was in 2020 and 2008. So is it not reflected necessarily in what your clients are doing, what they want to see in terms of positioning of their assets? Have you not seen the same degree of inflows that you would expect at a time of a mass rush into money market funds? Well, we have. We've seen a huge amount coming in um, to, to our liquidity products and to our money market fund products, and very much reflective of the information that the ICI has provided, very much reflective of crane data, um, you know, money market assets are at all-time highs. But we're not seeing it go out of our equity and longer term fixed income products. Instead, what we're seeing is, you know, deposits of banks down, you know, over the course of the last two years, two trillion dollars. And on a week over week basis, the most recent data showing that continue to decline. So I think it's coming out of other liquidity products that are just much lower in yield and Given what happened with, with Silicon Valley and Signature Bank, I think uh, reflective of diversification in the liquidity markets into money market funds from those deposits. Is this a problem that can be solved with rate cuts? Well, I think it's, you know, it's something that ultimately uh, could get you back to zero if there were truly a crisis, but I don't believe we have a banking crisis. And so simply cutting rates, you know, by 50 or 100 basis points, as the Fed projections say they might do in 2024 and 2025, isn't going to change it much because bank deposit rates lag interest rates going up but are sticky with interest rates going down. So I don't think you're gonna see, first of all, I don't think you're gonna see a return to zero or not in that type of a situation. Bank, bank balance sheets are very healthy. There's lots of equity, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, lot, lots of healthiness in the bank, the bank market. And I think that, you know, minor cuts that might come in 2024 or 2025 are not something that's gonna see parity again in that sector for a little while. Deborah, what do you suppose is more important to this Fed? What a rate cut would achieve? Or what a rate cut would signal? I think what a rate cut would signal. I think they see very little from an achievement perspective. And I think they got a little bit of cover, if you will, from you know what the, um, the ECB did last week with a 50 basis point rate increase and no huge ramifications uh, that came from that. And they even had, you know, they were dealing with a larger issue with, with, with Credit Suisse. So I feel like that, that gave the Fed a little bit of cover to increase rates this week, 25 basis points. And I think that's exactly the signal that they wanted to provide. They are still fighting inflation. They are still on their, you know, dealing with their core mandate. They are not fighting some sort of financial crisis here in the U.S. Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes. Deborah, thank you.
to some point, to some extent, Lisa, let's explore this. The Fed could get themselves in a bit of a bind here. They've basically told us that the financial stress, the difficulties, instability, pick your word, whatever, of the last two weeks is a substitute for hikes to some extent. It might have put a number on that of about 50 basis points. So let's say it's 50 basis points over the last few weeks. Let's say it gets worse. We're in and around where the median dot is right now, 5.1% for 2023. If it gets worse, wouldn't it make sense to reduce interest rates? Because you're saying that a financial instability is a substitute for rate hikes. And if you think you're very close to what you think is going to be sufficiently restrictive, isn't some form of adjustment required? This is the logic that's underpinning perhaps the move that we're seeing in markets. The question is, if you still see data that comes in hot, if you still see that consumers are spending, although it is softening, some of the credit card surveys show, then how do you diverge from what you said two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, which was inflation is the number one concern, not we want to make sure the banks are okay. So before you get the data showing how much lending is being constricted at some of these banks that are losing all those deposits that we were just hearing about, how do you justify that with a consistent message? It's the fear of what you're signal. And I think that's the issue with Fed policy at the moment. It's the obsession with what you're going to signal if you did start to adjust interest rates. The other difficulty I have, and I was discussing this with David Bianco of DWS yesterday, is that you can reduce rates but still have monetary policy that is tight, particularly if you have financial instability concerns continuing and lending standards tighten. So this idea that the Fed's backing away from rate hikes and that's being a good thing. Look, you have to think about it this way. It's important. If we had the SCP two weeks ago, that median dot was coming up to 550. The fact they've left it at 5.1, on top of the financial instability we've had over the last two weeks, I don't think that's dovish. I don't think that's dovish at all. Which they're saying, they're putting a number on it. You know, we were going to be at 550. We probably think this is worth 50. We stay at 5.1. It's not particularly encouraging to think that banks suddenly are not having deposits and cannot make loans, given how much that was a driver of growth. The market's essentially saying, this isn't enough, you're going to have to cut loads, and it could get worse. It's just interesting, the equity market's been resilient over the last couple of weeks in the face of that conversation. Really resilient. People want to uh, see some strength there, and honestly, the federated comment, they're sticking with it. Rallying through the storm in the equity market over the last couple of weeks. Henrietta Trace is going to join us from Vader Partners on TikTok and a whole lot more. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. UBS and Credit Suisse are among the banks being looked at in a U.S. Justice Department investigation. Authorities want to know whether finance professionals helped Russian oligarchs evade sanctions. The subpoenas also went to employees of some major U.S. banks. Credit Suisse and UBS both declined to comment. The CEO of Standard Chartered says the worst moments of the banking crisis are over. Bill Winters spoke to Bloomberg's David Inglace in Hong Kong. I hope we're through the worst. Uh, I, mean, I think there's still some, some, uh, some questions around business models uh, around the world. Is, mm. is, are, have there been weaknesses that have been exposed in the business models of, of any of the, of the companies that have had trouble that need to be addressed at this point? Um, but it, it certainly seems that the acute phase of, of the crisis is done. When asked if he would be willing to buy any of Credit Suisse's assets, Winter said Standard Chartered is always interested in looking at things with a decent return. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Has ByteDance spied on American citizens? I don't think that spying is the right way to describe it. Right. This is ultimately we can differ uh, on this that. Is, this is ultimately an internal Any investigation. Face palm, really hard, just brutal, brutal. I don't think spying is the right way to describe it. I thought his performance yesterday was super polished. Said a few times already this morning, very slick guy. 
that was a tough moment, a really tough moment. They were looking for one slip up and they got one. And it's not necessarily substantive necessarily, we don't know. But the bottom line is there is an impression that the Chinese government could get access to the data that is collected by TikTok at any time that they wish. And he was not able to allay those fears in the way that these politicians would have liked, not that they could have had those fears laid anyway, regardless of what he said. That exchange, has ByteDance spied on American citizens? I don't think that spying is the right way to describe it. I could play that all day. <laughs> That's just insane. Pro tip, anyone asks you that, the answer is no. And then the, and then you can say whatever you want, but you answer very directly so that the soundbite captures. But, but he wasn't able to say no. Correct. He said that instead. Right. What kind of questions and concerns does that raise? Correct. I mean, that's the issue. He should how, have just how said How would no. he describe it? Collecting data that could be used for... Right. Lots of other purposes. Okay. okay, but what's the distinction between TikTok and other uh, other uh, and other social media companies? Oh, it's a massive right? one. And this a is one huge, one huge distinction, distinction, and it's just one monster distinction, which is Facebook's not there. Well, is that the issue, or is it that That's the Chinese government massive distinction has also shown recently that they are more willing to encroach on business government divide, and they always have been. Why isn't Facebook there? Because the concerns that the Chinese government has about foreign tech is exactly the same concerns the U.S. has about tech coming out of China right now. You know, this goes back to, I, I used this word earlier, reciprocity. I'm not sure what happened to that conversation. Why aren't we talking about that a whole lot more? At what point, though, does that stretch into Apple? Does that stretch into all of the big tech companies that have substantial businesses in China, regardless of what IP or what uh, other types of security issues could get breached? True. Henry de Trace joins us now, the managing partner and director of economic research at Vader Partners. What a moment, Henrietta. I wouldn't subscribe it that way. I don't think spying is the right way to describe it. What were your thoughts when you heard that? Look, please stop. I mean, that was so terrible to watch. That was really tough. Um, and it was definitely one of the most aggressive hearings that I can remember watching. Uh, and I've seen quite a few of them. But I agree with your point. I think he did as great of a job as you could have done. The members knew what they wanted to get out of that moment, out of that five-hour hearing. Um, and it was, as some of the members were saying, the most bipartisan committee and the most bipartisan hearing that we've seen in a very long time. And I think that is uh, really what drove the attention yesterday. And they got the soundbite they wanted, as you pointed out, Lisa. Well, but Henrietta, how quickly can they actually get something done? Where is the actual political will to do something that could make some serious ripple effects, particularly among younger Americans? I'm really glad you asked. I don't think that there will be material legislation targeting TikTok specifically, and I do not think that there will be a national ban. I understand that yesterday's hearing was very explosive, got a lot of attention. It was the banner headline across all media platforms yesterday, but the Congress is not in a position to pass legislation to ban TikTok right now, even constitutionally if they could. Um, what I think is happening, and I would encourage investors to do, is watch Catherine Tai, the U.S. Trade Representative, today when she's up on the Hill for the second hearing in front of the House Ways and Means Committee. That's where you're writing a big, comprehensive China bill. And we saw her give a preview of that yesterday at Senate Finance. They were dueling hearings at the exact same time. Um, but if you didn't want as much fireworks and you were more interested in policy, you would have watched the Senate Finance Committee hearing. And that's what I was doing. So um, I would encourage people to watch Catherine Tai today, uh, Ambassador Tai, at 9 a.m., because they have issues about China's expansion into Latin America, Brazil, Russia, um, IP theft, human rights, climate issues. This is uh, the TikTok issue is one that effectively brings everybody to the yard, gets that bipartisan support we're looking for, um, and allows them to craft a comprehensive China bill, which the Biden administration is hoping to do um, after the debt ceiling standoff is resolved, or worst case scenario, in his next term if he gets reelected. When it comes to the consequences of this, how much are you watching TikTok and how much are you watching Apple and other big tech companies that have substantial businesses over in China? This is exactly what's in the Restrict Act. Um, that is the one bill that I do think could pass on TikTok. It's really about all emerging technologies, all social media. And it doesn't just target China. It also targets um, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba. It's, most, it's the most comprehensive, and it could theoretically put every uh, social media company on the front of the table and allow the Department of Commerce, obviously run by an extraordinarily competent Secretary Raimondo, um, to see what they want to do, study the issue, and then restrict and ban if they see fit. The TikTok CEO had a tough day. Secretary Yellen has had a tough two weeks. 
Henrietta, let's talk about policy. Where is this policy effort going on the banking front? Uh, nowhere fast. Um, I have spoken with Democrats and Republicans, House, Senate, for the last two weeks or two years, however it's been since SVB collapsed. Um, the reality on Capitol Hill is that the House Republican Conference is not prepared to move legislation on banking at this time. Um, there are many ideas floating around but there is no path to 218 votes from a majority of the Republican conference in the House on any legislation. And what I hear time and time again is that you need to see the impact of this banking crisis and the collapse of a couple sort of bespoke boutique firms, uh, which is how a lot of House Republicans think about this, really start to hit the heartland. You need to see farming banks, um, farming state impacts. You know, it can't just be commercial real estate that is reeling from this collapse and potentially seeing their lending ability squeezed. You need to see um, real heartland impact that's not just in a certain uh, couple of places. Most of the Republican conference, I would say about 80 percent, was not in office during the Great Recession, and they were not here during the banking collapse. And many of them ran on the campaign of we are against bailouts, we're against TARP. And when they look at you know insuring all deposits and passing legislation to hike the $250,000 cap, all they see is bailout. And that's not going to pass in this Congress. Do you see and can you identify a mechanism for the Treasury to move forward and temporarily suspend the limit on deposits? Is there a mechanism that exists in your mind? Yes, absolutely. And one thing that I recall, you know, I was in the Senate during the banking crisis, the ability of regulators to act is unparalleled. And the things that they can pull out of a hat are uh, really impressive. So um, I think the most focus right now, what I've spoken with Senate Banking Committee staff on, um, and I know Treasury is working on, is shoring up all the things that we would think of for extraordinary measures on the debt ceiling, I would encourage folks to look at Secretary Geithner's letter sent back in 2012, where he lays out like five different baskets of funding that the Treasury has exclusive authority over that they can tap into in, in the event of a crisis. This, this circumstance I'm referencing was the debt ceiling, but they can use that here as well. Um, the ESG fund in particular is getting a lot of attention. Treasury Secretary Yellen, once President Biden gives her uh, the sign off, is authorized to use the funds there, which were um, $216 billion as of January 31st of this year, to deploy as she sees fit. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the focus should be. It's on the regulators. Importantly, I think the regulators know that Congress is incapable of action, and so they are already uh, prepared to move, and they have experience if the members of the House do not. Just to finish on Secretary Yellen, she was asked whether she'd discussed some of these issues, and she said she hadn't discussed them. And I struggled to believe that, Henrietta, just struggled to believe that the Treasury hadn't had a discussion about doing away with the cap on deposit, deposit insurance through the mechanisms through which you've identified. Were you surprised that she used that language? I do think that there's been some maybe back and forth in terms of what they're telegraphing. Um, but I also get the sense the Treasury's trying to, you know, exude calm and uh, stress, as the Federal Reserve helped them do earlier this week, uh, that there's not a systemic banking crisis. Um, so I do think that acting unilaterally to, you know, provide unlimited backstop would have gotten a lot of blowback yep. if she'd committed to that. Um, just think about how quickly that sounds like a bailout, especially when you've got guys like Gary Cohn throwing out $10 million numbers. Um, that is just too high. So I, I do think that there was some strategy involved there, which was the worst scenario. Say that you are considering it on an unlimited basis or maybe just say, hey, we haven't had that conversation. I think she picked uh, the least bad option. What a tough spot. Henry Trey's there, a Vader Partners. Who would you prefer to be this week, Bramo? TikTok CEO, Secretary Yellen. Take your pick. Oof, TikTok CEO, because you had nothing to lose. You were already working to be maligned. Just lose, lose. Exactly. Just lose, lose. <laughs> You'd lost already. Exactly. <laughs> Patrick sort of Armstrong, like... Blurumi Wealth, coming up. <laughs>
the regional banks. Banks are really where the rubber meets the road in terms of taking financial policy and pushing it into the real economy. As the banking situation hopefully calms down, the data will become more important. The conversation is going to have to shift, I think, in the next few weeks towards what does the path to the next one to two years look like. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. I usually start Friday by saying, let's get you to the weekend, but the last two weekends have not been much of a weekend. So you don't want another one. Let's get you to a better weekend from there New we York go. City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. Equity futures down about eight or nine tenths of 1%. A couple of names to stay on top of this morning. Deutsche Bank is one, down 14%. UBS right now, Lisa, down 6.7%. First Republic was a little bit softer earlier. I'd call that unchanged on my screen, relative to what we have seen over the last few weeks. I would agree with those shares still trading with the 12 handle in terms of how much they've fallen. If you take a look at some of the other regional bank stocks in the U.S., also under pressure, whether it's PacWest or whether it's Western Alliance, why? Right. What happened, John, to really trigger ongoing selling? And this is the difficulty right now that we're having is we don't have a sense of where the risks lie, but the tea leaves, whether it's balance sheets or other data, highlight that there still is enough stress that banks are borrowing from federal authorities. Well, let's talk about that stress and push it through the bond market. When you have stress and push it through bonds, get a big rally. Two-year yield down 24 basis points, sub 360, Lisa, on a session. Right now, 359. 10-year down 13. Call it 14 basis points. 10-year right now, 329. What a move. So a month ago, two months ago, we were talking about the potential for a 5% Fed funds rate as late as January of next year. Now we're talking about a 3.5% Fed funds rate as of January next year. There has been a complete repricing in terms of how much the Fed is not going to have to just hike rates or not hike rates, but how much they're going to cut in the face of some of the stress that we're seeing in the banking system. Now, again, officials are not saying that this is the case. And you've asked a really good question. You've picked up on this and asked it again and again. Are rate cuts good for risk assets in an environment where it means that the economy and the credit tightening is doing the work for the Fed? Not all rate cuts are created equally. If you had projected rate cuts because you believed we were going to get that immaculate disinflation and the Fed could back away, great stuff. Markets should rip. The economy is going to be great. If you're cutting interest rates because things are breaking... I'm not sure things are great just yet. And the people who want to play the recovery, I think the tension, the point of tension for me and the point of tension that I'm asking a lot of questions about, and Lisa Levine was great early this week of BMY Mellon on this. She was talking about the trade after the trade, you know, the recovery to the recession we've not had yet. Do you want to start playing the recovery before you've actually seen the recession and the price action associated with it? What I've seen the biggest change in recently is where people see the real yields going forward, and it is much lower. Does that give you a boost to risk assets? And I am curious when people start to think, OK, if the Fed backs away from rate hikes uh, sooner, does that mean higher inflation for longer? How do we play that trade out if basically the stresses in the financial system cap the potential for how much this Fed can fight inflation when it still is an issue? That's the wrinkle in the story. Yeah. There is just this belief that they'll back away because it is a disinflationary shock and we'll get rid of the inflation problem. When only a couple of weeks ago, people were on this program saying there was a secular component to the inflation story. It was sticky for longer. It was high for longer. You're as frustrated as everyone else is with this story. The Nasdaq has just ripped over the last couple of weeks. The S&P right now is down about 1% on the S&P 500. Futures are a whole lot softer here. I'd say the dollar's a whole lot stronger too. The euro, negative nine-tenths of 1%, 107.30, and a big rally in the bond market. Joining us now is Patrick Armstrong, CIO of Plurimi Wealth. Patrick, you've usually got a really interesting trade. I know you were short Credit Suisse and you held some of the debt. Let's start there. Walk me through how that worked out. Um, so I was short Credit Suisse all of last year. I actually closed my sort, um, unfortunately, at the beginning of March. So I sorted, uh, covered it at 290, 2.9 Swiss francs a share. So uh, made about a 70% return on the sort. Thesis was not much upside in the equity, even though it's incredibly cheap, but bonds are going to be safe. Um, it's a systemically uh, important company. Bonds couldn't fail. So um had a bit of a scary ride over the weekend. I'm sure you did. Some of the bonds I own are uh, senior bonds, all senior bonds, but uh, at the group level. And there were scenarios where if it was a forced asset sale and UBS didn't buy the group, 
those bonds would have come under pressure and potentially even been worthless. But uh, it's turned out to be a good trade on both sides of those. So, Since we've clo closed Credit Suisse, so we're actually short uh, Bank of Nova Scotia in Canada now. And um, the Canadian banks became the biggest banks in the world in the financial crisis. Um, they weren't impaired, basically, by the, the same issues that uh, saw all the other banks plummet in value. And I, I think they're viewed as a beacon of safety. But Canadian banks have a property bubble to deal with, and they've got rising rates to deal with, and um, they're very expensive. You look at every other bank, bank in the world, and they're trading at frank, fractions of tangible book value. In Canada, they're still trading at multiples of tangible book value. So very expensive banks, very well-run banks, um, but with a property bubble, that creates some risks. Well, let's put some numbers on that property bubble. Patrick, how bad is that situation? Um, well, property, it's always uh, very hard to exactly quantify, but... Uh, Affordability index, Canada's right near the bottom of the world. Um, property prices have gone up 400%. Incomes are rising in line with the rest of the world. So um, zero interest rate policy that uh, led to property price jumps everywhere just were really magnified in Canada. Canada has big commodity exporter as well. So in high oil prices, the economy was relatively resilient. And zero interest rate policies have led to incredibly strong property market, especially in the big cities. Patrick, I'm going to help you out. Disclosure, you're from Canada, right? So this is some coming from a place where you can you can criticize uh, your own home more easily. I am curious of whether this is just a symptom of liquidity being drawn out of the system that is exposing other areas as overly inflated that have not gotten repriced down, where you see a potential trade. Um, well, it's a combination with Bank of Nova Scotia, just expensive versus other banks. Um, very high on book value, higher on earnings, and... Um, you are going to see impairments on its loan book because uh, banks, their business model is you lend money to people to buy houses. Um, if those house prices come back to normal on any measure versus history, um, you're going to have bad debt in Canada. But it's not just a Canadian story. I mean, aside from just real estate and there are issues or pockets of, uh, of issues uh, in the Scandinavian countries and other areas where there also is an affordability problem, it's also in private equity. It's also in private debt. We have seen this. We've heard this from a number of different people. And then others push back and say, well, it's either repriced or it won't have to reprice because the assets will uh, return to their value later on. Do you think that that's fair or do you think that there are pockets, nodes of potential contagion? Should there be some forced sale, some price discovery in some of these assets? Yeah, um, private equity investors are generally not forced into sell, but uh, if you mark to market properly, um, there's no way private equity dodged the sell off in treasuries, the sell off in equities, the sell off in every asset in 2022. But private equity funds mark their assets down 6%, some of them, things like that. But those aren't realizable levels. So I'm actually, I don't want to just talk about sorts, but I'm short EQT, which is a private equity, a lot of private equity assets. I'm short soft bank which was a play on higher interest rates and companies that have no path to profitability. But uh, it is also tying into what you just said about marking to market versus marking to what you want to market at. So, Patrick, tell me about the longs, since you don't want to talk about the shorts too much anymore. Um, What's your favorite long right now? My favorite long, um, I like BBVA. Um, if we're talking about banks especially, that's a, a company that's going to grow its revenue probably at 15% minimum this year. Um, they've told the regulator they expect to grow revenue at 25%. Um, interest rates aren't zero anymore. That was a big headwind to their profitability. Um, so I, I'm not anti-bank. I think some of the banks make sense. Um, I like to pair longs with shorts. Um, BBVA, I think, is very attractive value right now. The ECB's coming out swinging, talking about more hikes. You heard the... German central bank governor saying the same thing, maybe even speeding up QT in 3Q. Uh, you think that's achievable? Well, you've got to measure price stability, which they're worried about, but financial stability, I think, is first and foremost in uh, all the central banks where it should be right now. And uh, I actually think we probably aren't going to get as hawkish response as we probably would have otherwise. And it's going to sow the seeds for future inflation down the line because central banks' playbook, when there is financial stress, liquidity at it and um, you've got conditions tightening that are offset by the liquidity they're throwing right now so it's not inflationary right now but they have a tendency to leave those policies in place a little bit longer than they should so I think inflation is really dying out quick right now but I think it's probably got another leg up in response to what's going to be happening from central banks in the coming months. What's the growth profile associated with that inflation call Patrick? 
Um, well, so I think the U.S. is probably going to fall into a, a technical recession, probably just based on the tighter financial conditions, less access to credit. Um, my view was a month ago it wouldn't, and my view is now that it probably will, but I think it's going to be relatively minor. The employment situation is still robust. Employment's always a lagging indicator, but uh, 1.6 job openings for every unemployed person, that's going to change a lot before you see a, a meaningful disruption to the U.S. consumer. Patrick, fascinating to catch up. Great call on Credit Suisse as well. Patrick Armstrong there of Plurimi Wealth. I'm sure he hoped he'd held on for another two weeks onto that short, but 70%. 70% move? Yeah. That's a pretty big move. Yeah, he, he did pretty well for himself. What you asked there I thought was important, what growth profile is associated with that kind of inflation over the longer term and that increase that you might see in stimulus? A lot of people calling for stagflation. Can we put the stag inflation? Right. And that's, yeah. I think, where a lot of people are concerned about where do you go if you have that kind of environment, if basically central banks are forced to throw money at a problem that really is driven by the financial system, and then it leaves us back to square one again in terms of fighting inflation. The call on Canada is interesting, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's not just Canada, and it's not just equities. It's not just banks. We've heard the FX call being associated with the the property bubble as well, haven't we? Exactly. That basically you want to go into a place uh, where they don't necessarily have to see a pretty significant decline in home prices. Again, the FX analysts are becoming experts in whatever is the, uh, the narrative du jour. And right now, it's where are the nodes of contagion and where are the mispricings in the market? When Lisa's talking about nodes of contagion, you know it's a bad day. <laughs> Futures are down 9 tenths of 1%. <laughs> Deutsche Bank's down 14%. UBS is down 6%. First Republic is down about 4.5%. And this bond market is rallying hard. Your two-year, 358. Your 10-year, 329. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. prosecutors have charged Terraform Labs co-founder Do Kwan with orchestrating a massive cryptocurrency fraud. It's said to have wiped out at least $40 billion in market value. Kwan was already a fugitive from charges in his native South Korea. He was arrested Thursday in Montenegro. Deutsche Bank has become the latest focus of the banking turmoil in Europe. Shares fell and the cost of insuring against the German lender's default rose. Deutsche Bank has staged a recovery in recent years after a series of problems. Today, it is said it would redeem a tier two subordinated bond early, a move intended to give investors confidence. In Japan, inflation slowed for the first time in more than a year. Consumer prices, excluding fresh food, rose 3.1 percent in February from a year ago, down more than a full percentage point. But without the impact of government subsidies for energy and travel, inflation would have been as high as 4.4 percent. Ford is raising its projection of how many electric F-Series pickup trucks it can build at a factory under construction in Tennessee. The new estimate, 500,000 a year. Now, that's about 40 percent more than the company forecasts in November. The Ford factory is due to open in 2025. Hundreds of funds reportedly will lose their ESG ratings at MSCI. According to the Financial Times, MSCI is also planning to lower the environmental, social and governance ratings of thousands of funds. Now, the move comes amid growing concern that the ESG label is applied too easily. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We obviously are watching it very carefully. We've been very heavily involved in the last two weeks uh, in all of that. And I'm encouraged by the science in, in the UK banking system. I think we've got a banking system that is safe and sound. And of course, it's one that people can rely on. That's the thing we must have is a banking system that people can rely on. Now, I'm, I'm optimistic on that. I, I do think the banks are in a strong position in, in, in this country. Rinse and repeat, that was Governor Bailey, but that's been pretty much everyone her worldwide. Europe, the UK, the United States, Pick your country, and as a finance minister, a central banker somewhere saying their financial system, Lisa, is robust and your deposits are safe. Even Australia, the uh, head thing. of the uh, the governor of the of the Royal Bank of Australia, coming out being like, you know, Reserve Bank of Australia, excuse me, coming out and saying, you know, our, our system is strong and people aren't buying it. And so, what what's it going to take? Right now, 
Bank stocks are lower. First Republic's down 4.5%. Over to Europe, UBS is down about 6% over in Swiss trading. Deutsche Bank's down 14%. Maria Tadeo is in Brussels, where finance ministers are meeting. And Maria joins us now. Maria, what's on the agenda here? Well, Jonathan, this was all supposed to be about the economy, but I can tell you it's been absolutely blackout. Nothing has leaked. We know that in this meeting, where, by the way, Madame Lagarde, the head of the ECB, met with European leaders, the 27 of them. It was a meeting behind closed doors. No phones allowed. Obviously, the information there is being kept very tight-lipped. Uh, there was supposed to be a final press conference today with the heads of both the European Commission and the European Council. We hear that has been canceled cancelled now. But remember, up until now, the message from the European Central Bank has been there is no trade-off between price stability, financial stability. We can handle both and we'll do both. But obviously for Europeans today, what a cold shower. And Jonathan, just how sentiment flips so fast. Yesterday I was speaking to one of my sources and he said to me, you know what, I feel the worst of the storm for Europe is over. Everyone understood. Our banks are well-capitalized and well-regulated. You come in this morning, you look at these banks and the picture today it's not a pretty sight. We were talking a lot this morning, Maria, about U.S. leaders and the aversion to being associated with any additional bailout in the post-2008 world. How much does that cohere with the, with the rhetoric that you're hearing from European leaders over there in Brussels? Look, it's a very difficult question to answer because we have not really had any access uh, to European leaders. Usually this is a place where you scream and chat questions, you do get information. Obviously you have to hustle a lot on the sidelines to get access to what's being said behind closed doors. But this one, to me, what I'm struck by is the fact that it has been so well protected, the information of these discussions about the state of the economy and obviously by implication and extension, the banking sector. We are waiting for a number of countries potentially to bring us, but uh, overall, not a lot of the, not a lot has uh, come through out of this. The line, the standard line, however, up until yesterday was again: European banks are strong, they're well capitalized, they have liquidity, and they are well regulated. But obviously, the market today very jittery. This market's all over the place. Maria, thank you. Maria, today there out of Brussels. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Jan Patrick Banner. Jan Patrick, wonderful to hear from you as always. Deutsche Bank's down 14 percent. Lisa and I discussed it through this morning. Scratching our heads and saying, why? What's the news here? Where is the news? What is the why? Well, to me, it's not it's not a thing about like Deutsche Bank uh, on its on its own. It's just like a kind of a, a random move. I would even even say like last week we had like Societe Generale or BNP being the worst performers. What we're seeing today to me is like it's a pure recession trade. And you see this across the market, right, from from sectors ranging from banks to energy to autos to construction in Europe. You see quality factors being in demand while low quality factors are being sold off. And of course, <clears throat> If you have a bank like Deutsche Bank, who is like uh, hugely exposed to, to corporate lending and then especially to Germany, which is in turn exposed to the global economy, it's a stock that you're selling more than others if you are repositioning for um, this hard landing story that we are seeing over the past two weeks now. So um, to me, it's not about like Deutsche Bank being in trouble or anything like that. It's more like the market, again, picking up that story of hardly of, of a hard repositioning uh, of the economic narrative. Well, this really raises the issue, this issue of uh, Joaquim Nagel, the head of the Bundesbank, coming out earlier this morning with pretty hawkish rhetoric, and whether this hawkish rhetoric only accelerates the sell-off that we're seeing in some of these recession trades that you're talking about. Are you connecting the dots there, that the more some of the ECB officials lean into we have a lot more to do, the more the, basically rate hikes are priced out in the whole region and recessions priced in? Well, absolutely. And I think like the central banks need to be very careful there. I understand that um, the Fed as well as the ECB uh, both said like, OK, we are focusing on inflation. The job is not done and we are not want to create the impression that we have to uh, tap the brakes here immediately because that would then send a signal that there is something bigger wrong in, in the system. But still, um, I feel like that the, the, the speed uh, of which this um, breakdown in economic activity and with that inflation has accelerated a lot in the last couple of days. And central banks certainly need to take that into consideration going forward with their, with their rate path, that the job that they are trying to achieve might come in much, much quicker than they actually anticipate, and then that they need to move quickly from breaking inflation to supporting the economy. And that's a very difficult uh, thing to do for them. And they need to be very careful, I believe, in, in direction that they are taking over the next couple of weeks and months.
Yeah, and a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, okay, we understand the recession trade, but ultimately, why is Deutsche Bank down 11% on no news? Is that really simply because people are forecasting that there could be some sort of downturn in the future, which has been on the table for a while? Yeah, and how much are people looking at actual serious issues with counterparty risk, with the potential for the flight of, uh, you know, contingent capital bondholders, other types of contagion effects from not only Credit Suisse, but just in general, what we've seen across the banking complex? Well, I don't want to sound naive here. And of course, as always in the banking sector, you have an issue when the economy is slowing. Um, you have a lot of um, uh, credit exposure on, on your books. You are based in the country in Europe that has the biggest exposure to the global global economy. I don't want to be naive in saying like there is no issue at all. But for the moment, to me, like this is a, a, a earnings trade. And of course, Deutsche Bank's earnings will be hit, hit much harder than, than all the others. But we are not at a stage where this is a capital trade to me, where we like really see like massive right. problems with within the, the capital position of those banks. And that's a, an important distinction I think we should make at this point. It's a vital one. Jan Patrick, thanks for doing that. Jan Patrick Barnett there. I think that's a difficult one to make sometimes, though, when you see a stock down aggressively. You start thinking about existential risk, but clearly there's a lot of daylight between existential risk and then just a pure profit challenge. And I think we can all agree if we can escape the worst of this, there's going to be a pure profit challenge for the whole industry in a big way. Especially if the economy does have a recession and if Europe is facing potentially more issues right now, not so much. We got PMIs in the service sector earlier this morning that came out better than expected in Europe. But if that emboldens ECB officials to only hike rates more, does that send the downside even further south going forward in the future? You know the one I don't get? Schwab. Schwab was down yesterday 6 percent. The CEO spoke to The Wall Street Journal. Walt Bellinger and said there would be a sufficient amount of liquidity right there to cover if 100% of our bank's deposits ran off. So they're saying they've got all the liquidity in the world to deal with this, and yet the stock still finished the session lower, and I believe in a pre-market, it's softer too. This again goes to the profitability question, right? At what point does this challenge the business model? Or it just isn't logical. But I mean, honestly, that's sort of what I keep coming back to. And at a certain point, when does the price action become a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of credibility and, uh, and and just confidence from investors and from depositors? Are we escaping this weekend without emergency meetings? Are we done with that? I really hope so. I mean, honestly, this is the issue is we don't know what we don't know. And hopefully there is some stability. The data suggested that. The data that we got yesterday suggested... Some 200K on on claims. Who's paying attention to the data now? Well, not just that data, but also, yes, correct. I mean, there seems to still be stability in the market, although that's backward looking. The data from the Federal Reserve showing that lending went down just a little bit from the Fed to some of these banks, but it still is very elevated. People think maybe banks have taken the, the funds that they need at this point so they can sit on that um, and that that might not signal as much distress. The money market funds that's concerning to me because that means those are all deposits coming out of banks and going into money market funds. Well, that's going to really challenge loan creation and profitability. That's a big pile of money. Coming up at the open, Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management, George Concarvas of MUFG, Keith Lerner of Truist, and the brilliant Chris Mamani of Lafayette College. That conversation on Bloomberg TV in the next hour. One hour before the open of U.S. trading, and it does look a bit softer as we await some sense of whether we can go into this weekend with uh, some calm. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. John off to his next property. Tom Keen back on Monday. And right now, I'm Lisa Abramowitz taking a look at markets that are just soggy after trying to assess how much damage is being done. The real move, I think, this week has been yields so much lower, with two-year yields sharply under 3.6 percent. Uh, Right now, we do have some economic data coming out. Let's head over to Michael McKee, Bloomberg Economics and Policy Correspondent. Mike? We are getting, Lisa, the February durable goods orders numbers. Now, remember, this is February. It's a little bit old, and it uh, goes back to before the banking problem, although I don't know whether that would influence you to buy a new Boeing or not. But durable goods orders fall 1% after a 4.5% drop the uh, month before. Uh, X transportation is flat. And capital goods orders non-defense X Air, which is the one that economists watch because it's essentially a proxy for business spending, 
That one is up two-tenths of a percent after an eight-tenths increase the month before. These are the uh, non-revised numbers. I'm still looking for the revised numbers on those. But it looks like a still a little bit of, uh, of expansion in terms of uh, business spending, but not uh, a huge amount. With the headline number, and that's what I need to find here, uh, what we usually see is it's heavily influenced by Boeing because uh, those jets are really, really expensive. So I'll take a quick look here and see uh, non-defense aircraft uh, were down 13 point, uh, uh, down 56.3% for um, the, uh, the month of December and January. In January to February, they were down uh, 6.5%. So Boeing taking a lot out of the uh, first two months of the year, Lisa, but yeah. overall uh, the initial impression is it's not terrible, but this uh, obviously isn't going to influence the Fed in any way since or, they or markets. just met. I'll take you. I'll, I'll give you a, ch- a chance to, to parse through some of it. Not seeing a big change in markets, but we've been talking all week about how economic data doesn't seem to matter nearly as much, with the focus very much front and center on the banking situation and whether we see more stresses emerge in the financial system. Mike, as we really think about that, it is important to question the underlying strength of the economy and underlying uh, inflationary impulse, particularly on the services side. How much have you seen this ongoing divergence with uh, weakness? downside surprises to the good side of the economy, even at a time when you continue to see upside surprises in services. Yeah, and you look in the, uh, the under the hood here of the numbers, and machinery orders were down, computer orders were down, communications equipment orders were down. So ultimately, this doesn't come out as good as maybe the headline would suggest, not, not that it was great, but you have some of the key parts of the U.S. industrial economy seeing a slowdown in orders from business. So it's not, uh, it's not as good a news as, uh, as you might think. We also saw the prior month's number Numbers. The January numbers revised down from uh, four and a half on the headline to negative five on the headline, and the uh, capital goods orders shipments uh, were revised down from eight tenths of a percent to three tenths of a pe- percent in January. So the numbers a lot weaker than they had initially re- appeared. Michael McKee, thank you so much for breaking that down. And next week, uh, hopefully, we'll have a better sense of whether the economic data does matter again, given the fact that we are uh, on tinder, uh, hinder to hooks uh, trying to understand whether the banking crisis has been resolved. Pairing these ideas of the economic data and concern about loans being extended from banks, the potential credit impulse to the American population. Dana Peterson joining us now, chief economist at the conference board. Dana, I want to start by just asking how much has your outlook for the U.S. economy changed over the past two weeks? It really hasn't. We have been calling for a recession starting in the second quarter and extending through the fourth quarter. If anything, this might accelerate things. Uh, Certainly, consumers have already dialed back spending on goods. Businesses are not spending on investments. And also, the housing market has really folded in on itself. And really, the last shoe to fall is services. Now, a credit crunch really doesn't affect services because people don't tend to finance restaurant visits uh, other than using their credit cards. Uh, But certainly, we think that uh, in terms of durable goods and certainly the the ability for businesses to invest, that tighter credit conditions are not a good thing for them. And that will potentially cause the economy to have maybe a, a little bit worse recession than we're expecting. So that's what a lot of people are saying, is that this brings forward the recession. But you bring another uh, specter to the the table here, this idea of a potentially deeper recession. At what point do liquidity concerns at banks become a credit problem for the consumer, a credit problem for the economy, akin to what we have seen in history when there are liquidity issues? Well, if you're a bank and you're concerned about your deposit levels dropping, you're less likely to lend money. But the thing is that consumers are are already pulling back. They're not going out and buying cars and homes because interest rates have risen significantly, almost five percentage points in in roughly a year. So there may not be much uh, effect on the consumer, but certainly I think there's a risk for businesses who tend to need cash, especially to pay their workers and to invest and and 
in short-term and long-term ventures. So I think the pressures will probably be more on businesses relative to consumers. Does this also shift your view on how much unemployment could go up? Or do you think that we could get this downturn without some sort of structural increase in, uh, in joblessness, just simply because of the mismatch right now in the labor market? Well, the... The industries that are letting people go are the former pandemic darlings. Again, it's it's tech, it's finance, it's real estate, it's construction, it's transportation, warehousing, which were linked to the strong demand for goods. So that's what we're still seeing in terms of layoffs and weakness. But you still have these huge labor shortages in areas that are less sensitive to interest rates, such as healthcare and restaurants and, and hotels and so what we really need to see is consumers turn that, that dour sentiment that we're seeing in our, our consumer confidence gauge, which we've seen over the last year, into, okay, I no longer want to purchase services. And certainly higher interest rates may not get at that issue. But if, but if consumers think, well, I might be next in terms of layoffs, then they'll pull back on spending. But all in all, we still think that the unemployment rate's probably going to rise to about 4.4% next year. That's roughly a million jobs lost. I would not want to be in that number, but certainly not as bad as what it could be. We're speaking with Dana Peterson, chief economist at the conference board, as we look forward to another week, another month, potentially uh, rate cuts in the face of what some people are expecting uh, is a decline in economic momentum. Dana, here comes sort of the rub on the whole issue as we talk about perhaps a sooner recession, a deeper recession and a Fed cutting rates in response to that. Have we dealt with the inflation problem, especially given the stickiness that we've seen in recent data? I don't think we have. Uh, certainly when we see the stickiness, it's linked to wages through, uh, well, services through wages and very strong demand for services. Also food prices, which are being influenced by outside uh, effects. Uh, certainly the declines that we expect in rent uh, inflation, it's in the pipeline. We just have to wait for it to happen. Maybe it'll start in the springtime or early summer. But I don't think we've we've licked the inflation problem. And so that's why we're not anticipating that the Fed's going to cut rates this year, even if there is a mild recession. Um, if you still have prices that are so far above the 2% target, why would the Fed be cutting interest rates, especially if they also think that if there is a recession, that it's not going to be that bad? Well, and this isn't just an interest rate story. It's also a balance sheet story. And we saw the balance sheet increase dramatically over the past two weeks in terms of the Federal Reserve and its holdings. And, and part, part of this is not necessarily stimulative, some people will point out. These are emergency loans to certain banks. At the same time, can this central bank kill inflation if it keeps going back to the same crisis era tools to try to solve financial instability? Well, I think the Fed is trying to say that it can do two things at once, right? It can address inflation through the credit channel by raising interest rates and also the continued dialing down of its balance sheet. Uh, but it can also provide liquidity, which, yes, does hit the balance sheet. But it's two, you can think about it as two different wallets that the Fed is working with here. And so the Fed is saying we can provide liquidity to banks, and it's not stimulative because – Banks are taking this money because they needed to make sure that they remain stable, but they're also probably not going to lend this money. So that doesn't so that prevents it from being stimulative or inflationary. So I think that's the key thing. We have to understand the Fed has many different tools. It's using these different tools in different ways and that it can address inflation and providing liquidity at the same time. How much do you think that the Fed can cut rates? Well, again, we think there's there are no rate cuts for this year, uh, but we'll probably start seeing consideration of rate cuts maybe in the second quarter of next year. But we think that we're, we're not going to go back down to the low levels that we saw even before the pandemic because inflation may be structurally higher and it may be more difficult for the Fed to maintain that 2% target. So we think that maybe the federal funds rate next year goes down to around three and a quarter, four percent uh, but certainly not back to two or one or, or even zero unless we have some major crisis or a very deep recession. Dana Peterson, thank you so much for being with us of the conference board. We were talking about the balance sheet, and I want to bring Michael uh, McKee back in because we saw a massive increase in the Fed's holdings from $8.3 trillion to $8.7 trillion over just two weeks. Mike, what is the distinction between stimulative balance sheet expansion and non-stimulative balance sheet expansion? 
Well, that's a really good question, Lisa, and a lot of people are confused about this. What's going on is the banks that have these liquidity mismatches uh, on their balance sheets with assets that may be worth less because of higher interest rates are able to lend those to the Fed at par and get cash for that, which they can then keep in their accounts so they have enough money in case there are withdrawals. They're not going to be able to use it to make loans, and they're not going to be stimulating the economy with it. The loans are also temporary, 90 days through the discount window, a year through the uh, new lending program, and so they've got to give the money back. So this is a completely different animal than the normal QE, where the Fed buys bonds, takes duration out of the market, and puts cash out there to be put to work. Just 20 seconds, Mike. Does this, the, indic the data that we got yesterday indicate that banks have largely borrowed what they need? We don't know. Uh, I would assume that we're essentially there because by now you would know if you were a banker, if you had real problems on the balance sheet. But it might take another week or two for all this to work out. Michael McKee, thank you so much. As always, great work. And it's really important to keep watching the data. People are watching the data that comes out at 4.15 p.m. today, taking a look at what some of the loans are that banks are extending as we look for the senior loan officer survey uh, in next week. We are looking right now at markets on the move, lower, down almost nine-tenths of a percent in the S&P, 39.43 yields. Continue their descent, the 10-year yield, 3.3 percent. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Lisa Mateo. UBS and Credit Suisse are among the banks being looked at in a U.S. Justice Department investigation. Authorities want to know whether finance professionals help Russian oligarchs evade sanctions. Subpoenas also went to employees at some major U.S. banks. Credit Suisse and UBS both declined to comment. The CEO of Standard Chartered says the worst moments of the banking crisis are over. Bill Winters spoke to Bloomberg's David Inglis in Hong Kong. I hope we're through the worst. Uh, I, mean, I think there's still some some uh, some questions around business models uh, around the world. Is, mm. is, are, have there been weaknesses that have been exposed in the business models of, of any of the, of the companies that have had trouble that need to be addressed at this point? Um, but it, it certainly seems that the acute phase of, of the crisis is done. When asked if he would be willing to buy any Credit Suisse's assets, Winter said Standard Chartered is always interested in looking at things with a decent return. In North Korea, King Jong-un oversaw tests of weapons designed to deliver nuclear attacks against the U.S. and its allies. One of them was described as an underwater drone that can, can create a, quote, radioactive tsunami. The official North Korean news agency says the drone crews nearly 60 hours before detonating. Now, the tests also included cruise missiles carrying mock nuclear warheads. And shares of Activision Blizzard jumped in pre-market trading. The U.K.'s antitrust agency has narrowed the scope of its investigation into Microsoft's $69 billion takeover of Activision. The regulator now says the deal will not lessen competition in console gaming. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Like supervision generally, the stress test has become less rigorous over time. And I think, more importantly, it's become too predictable. And the whole purpose of a stress test is that you're trying to stress against the unanticipated, not the anticipated. Which goes to the question, how do you stress test against a Twitter uh, rant. And that has been sort of some of the questions. How do you anticipate the unanticipated? That was Dan Tarullo, former Fed governor, speaking on balance of power as we talk about bank issues and the concerns under the hood. One big question mark has been the value of real estate, in particular commercial real estate, not to mention uh, residential, and particularly on the coasts. And there is no one better for insight on that than Jonathan Miller, president and CEO of Miller Samuel, who joins us right now. Jonathan, I want to start there. This question around commercial real estate values that a lot of people have been pointing to as a potential note of distress, how much is that true? Oh, I think it's probably more true than we realize. Uh, the, the work from home phenomenon has fundamentally changed the metrics of commercial real estate and the idea that people are going to return to 
to the office five days a week is simply no longer a viable assumption. And we're already seeing that play out uh, in the security swipe data from Castle. We're seeing uh, the uh, the numbers sort of stuck at about half, meaning about half of the work of the buildings are being used uh, compared to their pre-pandemic um, uh, uh, usage. Uh, and and yet at the same time, we're having residential real estate on the rental side in cities like New York, uh, maybe not rising like they were, but remaining stuck at record levels. So there's this disconnect between commercial and residential as well. There's a lot of uh, a lot of issues to unpack there, and I want to start with this question of, well, if it's 50 percent occupancy, does that mean that you need to see a 50 percent decline in valuation for some of this office space in big cities? Uh, well, the, the short answer is yes, that's certainly possible. We're already seeing a significant drop. The numbers aren't reflecting that yet because with commercial real estate, you have people with five, 10 year leases at a market at a rate that was market prior to the to the restructuring of pricing. So it's going to be a long process, uh, but we're certainly seeing that. Um, one of the, the reasons why landlords are unable to uh, essentially, um, or why you're not seeing the market levels uh, drop as much as they have been, is because they also have debt service to, to, to cover. And uh, the, that debt service was based on the cash flows that uh, existed before the reset in the whole market. So I think this is a, a long, slow process. How much, Jonathan, does some of the concerns around recent banks, in particular Signature, which accounted for a significant part of commercial real estate lending in the nation, a disproportionate amount, how much does that accelerate this process? Uh, I, I think it accelerates it uh, uh, probably at an uncomfortable rate to landlords themselves. They were the go-to bank for a lot of uh, landlords uh, with what are known as rent-stabilized apartments uh, in the in the residential world, and uh, and it's one less lender to service uh, to, to the business. So it, it is going to make things more expensive for uh, landlords in that sector. Can we dovetail this over into the residential sector? And you talk about New York, and I would pair San Francisco with that. I know they're unique stories, but some people would argue if office space is getting decimated and people are not going back to the offices, it also will let people live wherever they want. More people are moving to the south, uh, to Florida, to the Sun Belt. At what point is this disconnect between residential in New York and commercial uncomfortable and needing to be bridged? Well, I think it's already uncomfortable and ne needs to be bridged. Um, but unfortunately, the solution for that is, I, I think a lot of people are sort of pinning their hopes on um, office or uh, residential uh, uh, conversions from uh, a dormant office space. And the reality is that uh, for probably 75, 80% of those uh, buildings, it's unrealistic because uh, there's a number of problems with that. The cost of converting to residential building codes um, almost from the start makes it a non-starter. Um, the other is the debt that's attached to the, the, that those buildings as collateral would have to be redone because it's a change in the status of the building. And I think one of the bigger problems is that the floor plates, the uh, especially in larger uh, office buildings, aren't compatible. You can't create apartments that are 20 by 300 feet with two windows. <laughs> um, so it, it it is a major challenge. And I think we're going to be struggling with this transition or figuring out what to do over the next decade. Jonathan, some people might listen to this and they might get a little nervous, especially with banks that are traditionally the disproportionate lenders to real estate uh, investors of all types having issues and say, wait a second, this could actually portend a pretty significant downturn in tandem with we, what we saw in the housing crisis, particularly in areas where that are big cities that typically have been office space havens that will no longer have the same allure. Do you agree or do you think that there is some sort of buffer or something to kind of offer Set those gloom and doom prognostications? I think it's an oversimplification. I, I, the way to think of it is, you know, when you think about the banks that have actually failed right now, it's really a small number. 
and I think there's a concern that it could spread uh, to you know to other institutions. But at this time, we're not seeing that. So I think you know this is sort of in we're in a panic mode, and I think uh, over the next couple of weeks, if nothing else happens, you know maybe that's an uh, indication that we're we're going in the right direction and out of the crisis. Do you think that rents have to come down on residential, that you have to start seeing some more significant declines in the residential price tags in order to right size things and, and bring something to a greater sense of stability? Well, one of the problems with the rental market has been it was already tight and the spike in mortgage rates more than doubling over the last year has pushed would be home buyers into the rental market, which has exacerbated the problem. We have uh, we have seen nationally rents, uh, residential rents begin to decline. And in New York, not so much. Rents have essentially been flirting with record levels since last summer. Um, but uh, the only way I can see rents fall in a meaningful way if we have some sort of recession or uh, or there's a much, um, a much more damage scene in the um, employment sector, uh, because other than that, I, I can't think of a reason with high mortgage rates that rents would see a significant improvement in affordability. Before I let you go, Jonathan, I'd love to talk about that mortgage rate, which has started to come down, especially on the heels of expectations of rate cuts. Where does the mortgage rate have to be to make the affordability proposition much more attractive to buy and send people back to that market rather than rent? Well, I think any notch lower uh, you know, improves affordability. Um, but I, I think, you know, that rates should comfortably sit in the fives, in the mid fives, and and that be the new normal. Uh, the idea of 2.75 30-year fix is preposterous. That's not sustainable. And look where we are now. Um, but but I think mortgage rates that are somewhere between, you know, somewhat lower than where they are, but uh, rates are not too high. They're just too high relative to the unbelievable lows that we saw over the last several years. Jonathan Miller of Miller Samuel, thank you so much. And I hope we can uh, catch up again soon, especially as the real estate story does evolve. We do have some headlines coming out of that meeting in Brussels where we were uh, talking with our own Maria Tadeo. Christine Lagarde uh, remarking to EU leaders, this according to a person familiar with the matter, saying there is no trade-off between price and financial stability. This, of course, has been her line for quite a bit, saying uh, that there is a need to progress on a banking union. So this perhaps talks to the closing of the spreads in the periphery and this question of whether greater unity to fight inflation does lead to a closer union in Europe. Also talking about the uh, euro area banking sector, saying it is strong. There is not a concern we are seeing right now. Deutsche Bank shares uh, notching just a touch lower uh, over in Germany, although still about down 12 percent. Barclays shares down almost 6 percent and UBS shares off the earlier lows. But again, there is a feeling that perhaps there could be uh, something that is playing out here, whether it's a recession trade or whether it is something more concerning about contagion. Coming up at 1030 a.m. Eastern, Mark Lazary, co-founder and CEO of Avenue Capital management, talking about the private credit uh, credit impulse and how that plays at a time of potential liquidity mismatches and uh, price distortions. From New York, this is Bloomberg.